Hello, everybody. Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. And guess what? It is hopefully time we're going to see uh, some static fire from uh, from SN9. This is this is the last, hopefully the last test here before uh, we get ready for flight. So fingers crossed we, we're all set up, kind of ready to go. Um, I hope you guys can hear me OK. People are saying we have a problem, but hopefully not. No, I think you guys are crazy. Um, yeah. Hi, guys. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, we have been setting up and getting kind of ready. This is a bit of a, a dress rehearsal for us. Uh, we've got quite a few more things that we're still working on. So in our world, it's kind of an OK thing that uh, that SN9 has scrubbed a little bit because we're still just in scramble mode. I don't know what it is. Um, so, yeah. So uh, just in case you guys don't know what's going to be happening here. This is going to be a three engine static fire, of course, three Raptor engines uh, on serial number nine. We, uh, serial number nine is of course a SpaceX Starship prototype. This thing is huge, nine meters wide, so 30 feet wide, uh, 50 meters tall, so about 165 feet tall. This thing is massive, made out of stainless steel, runs on liquid methane, liquid oxygen, um, and it has three of the world's most advanced rocket engines piped up underneath there. Uh, those are called the Raptor engines. They're full flow stage combustion cycle. These are all the fun things that we get to talk about um, on launch day. And I am really excited because hopefully this will be the final milestone before it flies. And of course, if you guys want to know, you know, when seal number nine going to fly, we actually do have a website dedicated just to that uh, or a page that will give you the most up-to-date information that we can. We just aggregate all the information for you. Um, you can go, go to everydayastronaut.com. Um, on the homepage, you'll be able to find a little link to when will SN9 launch, live updates, and we will give you our very best estimate of when this thing is going to launch. So everydayastronaut.com, uh, we will give you all the updates that we have so you guys can stay right up to date along with us. All right, back to the rocket. So, uh, yeah, so we're waiting to see some of the rocket actually venting. Um, Andrew, let's go ahead and switch to our other shot for a second. Um, we are working through a couple kinks on our end, but we should have two different shots for you guys. And um, we might be able to see a little bit different views for both of these. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're working on some big things for you guys. And I, I think you're really going to like the end product here. Um, for sure, by SN10, 95% sure we should have a really, really good solution for you. So, yeah. Um, let's get through some of your guys' comments right away because uh, I tend to fall behind on these things. So, Razumbot gives us a rainbow. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question from Musical Wolves. It says, how full do they fill the tanks when doing a static fire? Very little. Just about the very bare minimum in order to be able to light the Raptor engines. Like, down to um, likely probably not even beyond the bulkhead. So don't forget, you know, a rocket engine's fuel tank is basically, um, think of like a, a cylinder with kind of bulbous ends on the end of it, right? And, and kind of like a cup. And they don't even fill for static fire. They don't even fill the liquid fuel up to the top of that cup at the bottom of the bulkheads, the, the actual um, bottom portion of the liquid methane and liquid oxygen tanks, most likely. It's, it's a very small amount of fuel um, because they don't always actually, are, they're not always able to retrieve all of their, uh, get all the fuel back. So um, th there is some waste in, in recycling. It's, it's, it does get pumped back in, but it has to be rechilled and recondensed, um, but it's not a perfect one-to-one. -one. So yeah. All right, so um, this is from um, from Al uh, Alheim NJ. Thank you very much for your tip. I appreciate it. Uh, Razenbot, wait for it. Thank you very much. We we we've been doing a lot of waiting on SN nine, and hopefully this is one of the last times we have to stream uh, a static fire on this vehicle, or try to stream a static fire for the vehicle. Because yeah, uh, I think we all are just ready to see this baby fly. I don't know about you guys, so um, yeah. From, wow, from Chris Stone, who has credit over all these uh, ridiculous comments? <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really, really, really glad that there's so many people viewing a simple test fire of some Raptor engines. I know this is not exactly, this is a bit like watching rocket paint dry in a sense. Um, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. But it's just really cool to me to know there's there's 9,000 people around the world right now watching um, a simple static fire for uh, for SN9. And I'm looking at the vehicle from the pad. It's a little bit dark, but um, I, can, I can barely see it here out the window. But we will see. Um, let's see. So 
from uh, Joe uh, Rossiter. What happened to SN13 and 14? Well, um, as a matter of fact, I think it's even SN12 is actually on the, the chopping block now. Um, so they are just, it's basically like, why would they fly and test old hardware? Right now, their limitation is launching. They're limited by how much they're able to actually launch this vehicle. Um, even though they have two pads, it just seems like, you know, by the time you have pad operations and all the other things, the limitation does seem to be stuck on launch. And so why at this point, if they have serial number 15, which is more advanced, has some has some new techniques, some new likely new materials, some better welds, uh, different things that they're making large advancements on, why would they even bother with old hardware? It's, it's yes, it, it, you know, had a lot of labor costs, but it's still always a learning experience on how we can, you know, mass produce these, these vehicles and get them out in a, you know, in a quickly fashion. But as far as um, it's, you know, sunk cost fallacy a little bit, like what's, what's better in the long run to just keep flying the same thing over and over. If you already know, say for instance, right now, you know, we know for a fact SN8 had a problem with the header tank. Now we know for a fact SN9 likely had that exact same design in the header tank. So, you know, what's, what's the, you know, what's the point of flying four more of those versions that all have that same problem. The condition that they fixed for now is they switched to be able to backfill the header tank um, with with helium instead of using autogenous pressurization. It looks like I'm not doing my job very well here because I forgot to mention that we do have indeed video confirmation that the pointy end is up, the flamey end is down. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we also have the personnel. They are clear of the pad. The, the pad is obviously clear. Um, they're getting ready to test the vehicle at that point. Even as soon as the vehicle uh, begins any fuel up and any pressure uh, in any pressurization, they will actually go ahead and clear the pad because at that point, you know, pressure, just simply pressurizing a vehicle at say double the atmospheric pressure, two bars, three bars, four bars, that's a lot of pressure on that skin. And if it even ruptures just, just from, you know, say it was nitrogen or something inert, not even something explosive, it could do a lot of damage. Um, you know, we've seen that happen in their cryo tests where something it just goes, you know, in a pretty massive and pretty energetic uh, explosion. So not explosion, pretty massive and energetic failure there. There we go. That's the word I'll use. So, um, yeah, we, uh, this, they clear the pad right away. There are also some ground tanks forming, but not quite as big of ground tanks as, as we are used to seeing. We do have a rough, rough estimate of a T zero of around seven fifteen local, just kind of guessing. Um, Justin, Justin, Joe killer, bring Tim to bring Mars to Tim fund. Now I do like that one. We, we can bring me, so let's bring me some Mars regolith from, you know, maybe from perseverance or something. I would accept some of that. I think bringing any bit of Mars back here to earth would be a huge, huge win. A hundred percent. Also, I should mention for all of you that always are, um, are saying that, you know, the, the let's take Tim to Mars fund. I think we have a plan for that. Patrons, I'll definitely tell you all about it. Um, but let's just say, let's just say instead of a Mars fund, what if we called it a, a Texas studio fund? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. So maybe next time we're doing, you know, a super chat or something trying to send me off to Mars, there might be some, uh, there might be some more fun things. So, um, which might be better use of, of all of the, all of the funding. So, uh, from William Tails says, uh, will Starship need to be painted white eventually to help with boil off or will there be some sort of insulation? Great question, William. Um, they, uh, they actually do, they will be painting the lunar lander version white, probably likely for thermal considerations. There's, I, I don't actually know why white versus, versus ref, uh, reflective stainless steel. Um, white is probably going to be better. They, they shouldn't need any additional insulation. Um, they don't have hydrogen. So there are, um, so there are options there. There's considerations there because hydro hydrogen wants to boil off. If you look at it, basically, if you, if you have hydro liquid hydrogen just sitting out, it will be evaporated instantly, just instantly boils off and it's gone. Um, it's really hard to maintain, but liquid methane and liquid oxygen luck luckily are, um, substantially less prone to boil off because they're, they're quite a bit warmer. Their boiling point is quite a bit warmer. So, um, the, I actually don't know as far as thermal considerations, a reflective, you know, think about all the captain foil and stuff like that. Reflectivity can be a good way to, um, to keep heat 
from entering the vehicle. But the cool thing is on long coast phases and, and interplanetary missions, those header tanks also prevent boil off because they're basically going to be inside of a vacuum. And I don't know long term if the if the liquid oxygen header tank at the nose of the vehicle will always be in the nose or if once they get more equipment and stuff up there and payloads and all that stuff, if they don't need it up in the nose. But at some point, um, you know, right now the methane tank, when the main tanks are dry, it is actually basically in a vacuum. It is there is no thermal conductivity, uh, you know, through uh, any other medium. It can be sitting there basically in a vacuum chamber, which is um, it can be, although it isn't because they do have to have it pressurized and backfilled with currently with helium, but also later with gaseous oxygen, and gaseous, gaseous methane. Well, actually, currently the, the main tanks are backfilled with gaseous oxygen and gaseous methane. Um, but the header tank. Anyway, point is, there's ways to mitigate boil off, and SpaceX is working on some creative solutions for that. I have to close this window because, believe it or not, even though it's Texas, it is really cold. Um, all right, Matthew says, "Hey Tim, uh, did we find out why the last static fire was so short?" Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll, you love your full flow T-shirt. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for the support. Um, we don't know for sure, but there's been a lot of speculation that that uh, it may have been. A two engine static fire when it's supposed to be a three engine static fire and if that's the case it definitely would need to be uh redone for sure so um yeah that's that's what we were kind of hearing we don't have any official word on that though um but it does kind of seem like it was only a two engine static fire versus a three which was not the intended plan so that's why they're having to redo it um we don't know exactly what other holdups there are but we're hoping to see this thing just have a nice, clean, full duration of about three seconds static fire tonight. So if you are watching this and you're expecting anything more than a bright orange, what will end up looking like a bright orange cloud of smoke for three seconds, I'm sorry, you're going to be very disappointed <laughs> because that's about all we're going to be looking at here today. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I like this. Jody says, funding for a studio there. Call it, of course, I'm filming. <laughs> of, of course, it should be, of course, I'm still filming. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, uh, from Rohan says, uh, will recharging super uh, starship slash super heavy be an issue for rapid reuse? The actual recharging the batteries. Now, that's something I have not thought about. It shouldn't be too big of a deal. Those Tesla batteries, um, you know, you can go from basically depleted to basically full in about an hour. And the booster will, will be looking for about a 90-minute turnaround time. There could actually be some things that they could be doing to mitigate that, like actually um, having smaller and more connections and, and a lot of voltage, though, running through the vehicle in order to, to charge it that quickly. But, you know, if anyone can do it, it's SpaceX and Tesla because Tesla obviously has a lot of experience with high voltage. But, yeah, um, yeah. Um, no, the uh, – yeah, we'll, we'll keep the, the timer up for now. Uh, Musical Wolves, thoughts on sending a submersible to Europa to bring water samples back to uh, to curiosity to analyze and also check for fossils of um, oceanic life using uh, stainless or using Starship. So um, as far as having uh, curiosity or perseverance or something, look at something. Um, it'd be much better if you're if you're sending something to Europa, you might as well just bring it back to Earth. Um, the Delta V difference to get from from Europa back to Mars and, and Earth is actually quite similar because you're at such a high apogee. Um, you wouldn't have to do that much bigger of a burn. And it'd be much easier to recover a capsule on Earth because of obviously our denser atmosphere, but also just humans going and swooping something up and then recovering and looking at the samples as opposed to trying to rely on um, landing close enough and accurately enough to be able to actually grab a sample uh, with a robot just and analyze it and all that stuff just adds a lot of, com uh, a lot of complexity. So... Um, yeah, so um, as far as um, check for fossils of using uh, uh, Starship, I mean, I, I don't know if Starship – Starship doesn't really make sense outside of the inner solar system as it is without with its large flaps and stuff because you're lugging those flaps all the way out. You know, there's been talks, of course, about a more ex expendable version of Starship um, or an interplanetary, like a, basically just a boost stage upper stage that would not have any flaps or any recovery hardware lighten it up you know you could probably lighten it up several several dozens of tons you know maybe 20 30 tons you could remove in the in the weight of the vehicle if you're not trying to recover it you know no heat shield no flaps no landing legs um if you're not trying to recover it you might even just be able to get away you could probably get away with just a bunch of vacuum raptors like four vacuums you know one in the middle and 
and three more on the outside and and just use vacuum optimized rafters only and you could get substantially more payload um, sent off for interplanetary missions so um, i think we will see variants of starship i don't think starship is just this one vehicle like we see it here today it's this whole wide um, variety of vehicles essentially um, from thomas says will starship be able to do earth to earth transit without super heavy um, will this save a lot of money on fuel? Yes, and that's Elon's even mentioned that a lot of people gave me pushback on uh, the the rocket pollution video uh, because I quoted point to point as Starship only with no super heavy booster because Elon has talked explicitly about how they'll they likely only use Starship uh, without a booster, but it won't be able to go orbital. It'd be suborbital. I think he said the maximum range would be about 10, uh, 10, 10 thousand kilometers. So. Um, you know, that gets you about, what, a third of the way around the world or a quarter around the world. You can get you can do a transatlantic flights probably with that. Um, but it's not going to be full-blown, you know, uh, New York to Sydney or something. You know, it's not going to be completely opposite side of the world type of stuff there. So um, they might someday be able to stretch it more, make point-to-point -point options that, are, that have better glide ratios, that have, you know, like wing strakes and stuff like that. Things to actually help and, you know, maybe even – more engines or something or who knows um there, there there's things they could do for a specific point-to-point -point variant but in, in general again starship currently is just kind of a blank slate starship is currently just basically um oh andrew we lost a feed there thank you um yeah oh, it's, I see you know what went wrong yeah, you in, ah i plugged in i plugged in the wrong one did you hear that I, plug, I did plug it in. <laughs> so, <laughs> you think we're gonna get some audio? Yeah. Oh, baby. Yeah. Sorry. We've uh, we've had to redo about everything lately. So, um, we are in the middle of that. Um, can you switch cameras? Or you're you're probably about to get it anyway. Um. All right. So. All right. Let's keep going here. So yeah, like I said, it'll, it'll basically be like a, a blank slate. You know, um, Starship can kind of be anything it wants to be, but for now, they're just trying to get. Um, the parts figured out, you know, it's don't solve step three until step one is done, you know, or don't still don't solve step 50 until step three is done. You know, it's like go sequentially start with the bare bones and the bare bones in the Starship program was well first the Raptor engine. That's not bare bones. That's extremely difficult. But from there on out, it's been Starhopper. It's been, you know, it's been all these other um, test flights that we've been seeing CL number four and five, just very simple, just more advanced versions of the manufacturing process closer to flight ready hardware compared to Starhopper. It's just a continuation of that uh, to that effect. So um, W Dub says, um, a user said Starship doesn't glide, but doesn't it? Its fins control horizontal movement during a descent. If a squirrel glides, surely Starship does. <sighs> this, is, this is a bit of a whole thing because technically, I mean, anything can really provide lift. A capsule, for instance, can provide lift and can change its glide ratio. Um, now, if we're gonna be pedantic here, um, you know, I, I would probably like to say that anything that really glides need to ha needs to have a positive glide ratio. So beyond a one to one. So for every meter you fall, you're translating a meter forward. Let's just maybe agree that, um, there probably is an exact definition and I'm sure people, uh, proper, <laughs> proper people are, are going crazy. Um, so let me know guys. Um, but in general though, if you think about it, the uh, the Starship, of course, you know, if it's coming in from from orbital reentry speeds, it will be Elon said about seventy degrees. The space shuttle flew at forty degrees. It could go all the way to about ninety degrees because when it was falling from from its SN eight flight, it was falling completely perpendicular to the wind stream, completely flat on its belly to bleed off as much terminal velocity. So that means through reentry, it can be coming straight on if it needs to be bleeding off as much speed as possible. But you can also tilt it, and when you tilt it, there does end up being a a, some body lift and some lift off of those flaps so it can have lift now as far as gliding goes i would definitely i would definitely say it's not set up to glide because there is not traditional lift in the sense of you know lifting surface like a wing which actually increases the surface area on the top portion of the wing has a lower surf a lower amount of travel for the bottom portion uh and therefore can actually produce lift in a traditional sense um this does not have that at all. The, the flaps and everything is flowing mostly more perpendicular to the windstream than parallel to the windstream. So therefore, long story short, Starship can't really glide. It can increase its lift. It can fall straight out of the sky, but it's not going to be ever really gliding at some point. So hopefully that answers that question. All right, this is from um, 
ambient uh, ambient LP. Seal and Iron uses uses helium, but what is the final solution? So they will go back to. So it sounds like to me they've only switched to helium in the methane header tank. Now the header tanks are likely still pressed. Um, so here's the story with any fuel tank, any rocket liquid rocket fuel tank like that. Whenever you're draining a fuel, you have to backfill it because if you just took a sealed container and you drained fluid out of it, you would crush. You know, you the container would collapse. So you have to backfill it. So normally you use an inert gas like helium or nitrogen. Helium's the preferred choice because it's a lot more sparse or undense. You can pack an uh, absolute crap ton of it inside of a COPV, and then it expands and fills volumes with ease because it's so sparse, right? Now, um, if you nitrogen is a little bit less sparse, but the problem with helium is it's stupid expensive. So you can do what the space shuttle did. Don't forget the space shuttle's external fuel tank was autogenous pressurization. So it actually used um, gaseous uh, hydrogen in this case and gaseous oxygen tap-offs from the main engines. The, the SSMEs, the RS-25s, actually had hot gas coming out of them and, fi and backfilling the tanks. As the tanks drained, the engines actually bled some of, those, some of that fuel and put it right back into the tank to, to maintain proper tank pressure and all of that stuff. So... Um, it is actually, it's not like it's some crazy thing that's impossible or anything. This is, this has been solved before in space flight. And currently they seem to have some teething problems specifically in the header tank. Don't forget the header tank is a per basically a perfect sphere. So there could be some slosh issues. There could be some, some kind of issue with the spe specificalities of the header tank, but the rest of the vehicle, as far as we know, is still being pressed using autogenous pressurization. So, um, yeah, I, I think that it will be the final solution because you can't refill helium on Mars. You can't refill. You could actually probably refill refill helium on the moon, kind of, um, but not on Mars, uh, at least not very easily, I don't think. So it makes way more sense and way cheaper because, believe it or not, the tiny little COPV bottles, uh, that little amount of helium is probably more expensive than all the rest of the propellant on the vehicle. So, um, yeah. Um, and uh, Nikolai says, can't you just open up a valve to open air and let uh, and let it fill the tank? No, because the tanks are at much higher pressure than here at sea level. The tanks on, on Falcon 9 are about three bars. So they're three times more atmospheric pressure than here at sea level. If you open up the tank, it's going to spew gas everywhere. That's, what's, that's what happens. It's going to spill everything. The pressure will go outside. Now, here's the thing. In, and then it gets only worse from there. When you go up into to space, there's even there's literally obviously no ambient air pressure. So you know, in that case, the the uh, the if you opened up a valve, all the fuel would just leak out. All the propellant would just leak out immediately. So yeah. Um, move, people are saying move T zero to five minutes ish. I don't know why we're thinking five minutes ish. I don't even have any kind of any kind of update yet for that. So. Um, we're not seeing much on our end, but, um, yeah, temperature five minutes more is what, I don't know why, why we're thinking that, but we probably could. This is all a guess. This is a guessing game for us here, guys. Um, have we even seen the vehicle vent yet? All right. Um, All right, well, according to spreadsheet guy, we're looking at <laughs> uh, we're looking at like adding five minutes. So, hmm. But we have not seen any vent yet, so we'll we'll keep our eyes open. Um, but let's keep answering your guys' questions. So, hey, thank you so much for for the pair. I really appreciate that. Uh, Sore eyes three forty five. Thank you very much. That's very generous. I, I appreciate that. We're gonna put that straight into the. Secret Mars Fund. Uh, what does Starship mean to SpaceX's competitors? Uh, honestly, if I was SpaceX's competitor, I would be, I'd be very nervous that it's going to be extremely hard to catch up at this point because Starship is stupid ambitious. If Starship succeeds in doing what it is hoping to do, it's going to take their five to ten years ahead of the competition, and that's not hyperbole. That's just simply people won't be able to compete with starship starship will if starship ends up being fully and rapidly reusable uh which 
realistically could happen by the end of the 2020s. Just look at how quickly Falcon 9 starts, started to actually see cost savings because of the reusability. People thought it would take a decade. It took about a year. It took maybe two years tops for Falcon 9 to be like cheaper because of its re reusability. Um, if Starship gets to that same point of two, three years once it's operational of starting to see that cost benefit, yeah, it's going to be game changing because not only will it have the highest payload capacity, but it also could be one of the cheapest rockets to fly, period. Like cheaper to launch an entire Starship than even, say, a small sat launcher. And that's kind of insane because now you have, say, a $5 million price tag for 100 plus tons of payload capacity and a huge amount of volume. So now you're not design constraint. You don't have to worry about these packed, compact, little, fragile, lightweight satellites. You can just, you know, if you're a satellite provider, you go, you know what? We have this new super heavy class. We can design uh, to that super heavy class and we can actually make um, a heavy, big, bulky satellite and save a ton of money because now, you know, when you try to make things lighter, just go ahead and look up how much like a carbon fiber tripod is compared to a good old aluminum tripod. You'll poop your pants because it's about three times more expensive normally for the exact same thing. Uh, it's the same exact thing in spaceflight. You know, if you can use less exotic materials and just use off the shelf stuff um, at the at the sacrifice of size and weight, you can save a ton of money. So this could really change the entire economy of spaceflight. For now, I um, hope to see SN fly during my time off. Doubt it, but I hope. At least I can see the static fire. Good good attitude there, Renau. Thank you for saying hi. Good to always hear from you. Um, yeah, hopefully we do see a static fire tonight. We, we really haven't heard um, anything too much, so uh, we will see. We will see. Still no rocket venting. It's, it's definitely likely that it's, it's moving back um, a decent amount here. So um, let me make sure I'm checking in here with, with Rachel. It's, or, sorry, it's actually Gene and Ryan out there tonight. Um, let me make sure everything is good. Um, make sure that we're, we're also kind of working on some audio issues, but we fixed it. We actually have audio going. Sweet. Okay. It was that. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, from Jay Wood says, um, hoping for a big, long explosion. Well, hopefully not. Yeah, I'd say a long explosion. If it's less than three seconds and it's really big, then we're in trouble. But this is hopefully going to be a very controlled explosion. Uh, perfectly out of the nozzles of the Raptor engines. That's what that's if this thing were to go boom before we even see its flight, I will cry at this point because I need I need to see this thing fly and we've already spent um, a week and a half down here and it's not cheap. It is not cheap to, to stay um, which is exactly why we're working on a secret project. Uh, X team official, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Um, Nicholas, whoa Nicholas uh, thanks, Tim and the crew, uh, for me. See you guys soon. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nicholas. That is really, really, really generous. I, I really appreciate that. Holy cow. P same with another one from Chris Stone. It says, can't match what the Superman who did uh, who studied under Von Braun did, but love watching Mr. Dad. Well, thank you, Nicholas and Chris Stone. You guys, that is so amazing. Thank you so much for your generous tips. I really, 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 really appreciate that. That that goes straight back into everything we do, and I, I promise that by the end of the year, uh, we're going to have uh, the best solution that we can possibly have for you guys to be able to provide the best coverage we can. That's that's all that matters to me is increasing quality, increasing um, everything on our end. We, we spent every dime and then some uh, from what came in last time <laughs> to upgrade equipment and gear. Uh, we're having a little bit of teething problems with some of it, but it's all a learning experience, and um, we're just going to keep upgrading until we can provide the best coverage that we can for you guys because... Um, this is history. This is history in the making. We are literally watching the evolution of spaceflight. We are watching, uh, you know, rockets evolve in front of our eyes and, and usher in a new era of spaceflight. And, you know, we look back, you know, I get so fond when I look back at images of the Apollo era. You know, when you see the Saturn V being built or rolled out, um, all these things, you know, I, I, I get a little tear in my eye and I get so proud knowing that we did such a good job of documenting that there's amazing you know people that that documented it. nasa did a phenomenal job filming there's just incredible uh footage you know especially watch the apollo 11 documentary that um that i think cnn put together uh and remastered and everything and that is uh, was it cnn that, Matt, that redid the yeah um that was just incredible there was footage there that that will just j j jaw dropping and we're at the beginning we're, we are seeing that now this is that now you know so I, I think we really, really, really 
Um, yeah, we need to push the clock. Let's give it at least 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, people say they're hearing slo water sloshing sounds coming from my... It's not my mic. That's The water sloshing sounds is from the water. It's the water sloshing. Yeah, the, the, the camera down there, the camera you're seeing is next to water uh, at the edge of the exclusion zone for you guys. So we have it as close as we can safely get. So um, we... Yeah, uh, yeah, water is cam. So again, yeah, Nicholas and Chris, thank you for helping to allow us to capture history and, and preserve it. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know why everyone wants us to move the clock yet, but I guess we probably, we probably could put it on a big old fat question mark or something because we're definitely not at 10 minutes here for this. But we are seeing... Some more venting from the ground by the rocket. Um, yeah, that could just still be from the tank farm. I wish I could fix the white balance on that camera. Too bad we didn't plug in the network adapter. We could have just remoted into that one. Yeah, I mean, you could always just go walk out there. It's really cold. <laughs> We're saying that, and poor Gene and Ryan are like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, Aaron says, uh, never seen a Falcon 9 land, but I don't want to drive to see it land and it lands on the drone ship. How do we know uh, where the first stage will land? Aaron, that's a great question. That's We have those we make those pre-launch previews for you. Um, so everydayastronaut.com, click on upcoming launches, and you can read our pre-launch previews. Those will tell you uh, if it's going to land and where. Now, we don't give you a ton of leeway time. Uh, the next best way to probably know would be I don't actually know. CRS missions are likely not going to be landing on land anymore either. Yeah, we're kind of moving away from that, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, uh, our, our pre-launch previews can, can give you a decent estimate, but not always immediately. You know, um, they, they, it might or not too far ahead. It will. We normally try to get them out about a week or two ahead of time. So that might not be enough time for planning. Sometimes you just kind of got to wing it. So, yeah. Um, Alec says, send him to Texas on Mars. Or remember, someone did say there's a Mars, Texas. And I will go ahead and, spoiler alert, I'm not going to build a studio in Mars, Texas. That would be a very silly endeavor. Um, yeah, it, that's not what, that's absolutely not what I would do. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. Um, man, yeah, we haven't seen any, we've not seen any rocket venting. Yeah. Let's just change it to unknown. There we go. I wish we could just put this up. Do you have the... Let's do that. Yeah, so it looks good. Do it right. Um, uh, Creeford has a question in our Discord channel. Uh, do we know if the Starship lower stage, so the, the super heavy booster, is going to land on land or on a drone ship? It will never likely land where from a different place than it takes off from. That's that's a big part of its rapid reusability is being able to literally land it back at, at the launch site, you know, uh, someday maybe landing inside of a cradle and being literally dropped back onto the launch mounts. Um, the, um, <laughs> I like that T0. <laughs> T minus. Mm. Uh, that is a pretty big part of it is, is landing back where they can literally just like pick it up and put it back on the launch pad and refuel it. Um, it it's a very large vehicle, so... I think someday eventually you know, we'll, we'll likely see a C platform for Super Heavy and Starship, and it will always likely return to the launch site. It's not quite as fuel efficient, and people are probably going, why don't they like, you know, go set up every four or five hundred miles or you know, a thousand kilometers or something, and have one land on the next one, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and do that. Well, inclinations are always changing. If you're actually trying to get into orbit. Um, Especially from, you know, like, say, Kennedy Space Center, you can fly up to, like, 60 degrees north, uh, as low as 28 degrees uh, in latitude uh, for, your, for your inclination. So you're almost never, ever going to be flying on that same exact route, and it doesn't really make sense to do it around the world like that. So you're, you're just better off returning to launch site. You do lose about 30% um, of your payload capacity compared to, um, or about 30, you use about 30% of your fuel, so not necessarily 30% of your payload capacity, but you lose a decent amount, com but compared to 15%, uh, 
when you don't do um, a, a downward landing, um, a, a downrange landing. So um, this is from uh, from Richard and Tracy says Texas Studio Fund. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, I, I if we're working on something, we're working on something. And if it works out, it will be phenomenal. And, uh, and uh, it's seeming like it's going to work out and it will be phenomenal. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned. Harry Games, white looks better. You like? I do actually. I kind of do like the white painted human lander. I think it looks great when you see it in person. It looks really cool. Although I think the shiny starship, once they get uh, further along and with more advanced welding, better finishes and all that stuff, I think the shininess will look amazing. Will look a lot smoother and a lot cooler than it does right now. So maybe we'll see a little bit of both. So, um. Yeah, spread, spreadsheet guy, Adrian, we need to probably be following Adrian um, because he says, you know, average time frame between skirt venting and tri venting is about 14 minutes. That time is long past now. So, yeah, we haven't seen any um, any skirt venting. We haven't even seen any vehicle venting. So, um, yeah. So uh, currently, uh, as we know, that the road closure was until 8 p.m. SpaceX is known to push that road closure arbitrarily much later than 8 p.m., so we're not going to give up the ghost yet. Um, by the way, do uh, are we keeping Ryan and Gene up to date with with uh, what we know? Because I don't know if they're able to listen to us necessarily. So, um, Oh, wait. But did we already see a skirt vent? Um, I don't think we've seen a skirt vent. We better also be recording just in case, though. Are they recording down there? Do they have? Are we hearing venting? Oh, all right. Well, let's let's keep going here. <laughs> Texas Studio Fund. Thank you very much, William. I really appreciate that. Uh, that means a lot. Let's see. David says. Um, David, will, uh, David, of course. Hi, David. How are you? Uh, why are these static fires so short, like only a few seconds? Wouldn't it be better to do a full duration fire? I think the main reason for that is the launch pad. They don't have any flame diverter. They don't have any flame trench. They're just blasting concrete. And if you blast concrete for four minutes straight with the world's uh, <laughs> with a, one of the most powerful rocket engines flying right now, you're going to end up just absolutely just destroying your launch pad more and the the ground actual concrete more the pad uh more than they want right um is that is that venting right now it does look like it's venting okay okay so rocket let's make sure we check off rocket venting um um let's see oh yeah uh, cloud boy yes gene and ryan definitely deserve more than coffee money we we pay them human money <laughs> like we pay them well to to make sure that their their time and efforts are are worth it because especially like on a night like tonight taking a boat out to the middle of nowhere to be able to film for you guys is a dedication it is um it is very cold it is let's see here 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So what is that? About 10-ish degrees Celsius. It's it's quite chilly. Um, yeah, not very not very fun. Okay, cool. Uh, make sure they're ready to record too. Okay, cool. Do you want to go hit record on this guy? Sorry. Fix the white balance while you're at it. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, yeah. So David, I think the main reason that we don't see uh, that we don't see long duration static fires is just simply because of the rinky dinky launch pads that they are currently launching from. So yeah. Um, I, I know that David's probably excited because there's going to be the green run of SLS here in uh, a couple days. We're at about five days or did it move up to the 16th? I actually thought I heard it say it moved up a day, which may be stacking the solid rocket boosters for SLS uh, was a good little fire under their butt because 
uh, for this is maybe one of the first times that something has moved left in the schedule. So I don't know if I'm right about that, but I swear I heard that it moved to the 16th and it was the 17th. So, um, yeah. So I, I'm excited to see that because that will be eight minutes of full duration RS-25 firing out at Stennis Space Center with SLS. And that'll be really cool. I mean, eight minutes, let's do it. That'll be that'll be loud and crazy and super cool. So I'm excited for that one. X-Team Official says, will Starship be like the Space Shuttle in terms of production and use? Uh, production, way different than Space Shuttle. There will likely be a fleet of Starships. We're already seeing a fleet of Starship prototypes greater than all of the Space Shuttles that were ever made. There, there are essentially six orbiters. Obviously, one... The Enterprise never, never flew, but it kind of could have ish. It had a lot of a lot of flight, real flight hardware, but it was not an actual orbital um, orbiter. Now, of course, the other five uh, flew quite a bit and did quite well in that regard. But we're already seeing substantially more than five Starship prototypes, and that's just prototypes. They're gonna crank, keep cranking these things out and just have a whole fleet of them. So we should see uh, we should see them be used a lot more frequently. We should see them uh, there be a lot more of them. So we will see. All right, we should probably keep our eyes on it here any second because uh, I, I mean, just in case we we don't really know. Um, yeah, we will see. All right, so someone in the, uh, in the back, thank you so much for your membership. I appreciate that. Um, Jonathan says, uh, I'm just here to hang out. Jonathan, you're in the right place then. Cause that's, that's pretty much what we're doing. You know, on these nights when, when there's just a static fire, we're not going to see much action at all. We're kind of just hanging out. And sometimes that's what I love about rocketry and aerospace and, and science in general. It's just kind of a, we can make these social events, you know, uh, we can have something to look forward to have something to talk about. That's, that's a positive, uh, good thing in the world that we can be excited about. So uh, I, I'm glad that you're here to hang out. I'm basically here to hang out at this point. Uh, really hoping that we see static fire tonight because it'll just keep adding and adding and adding to um, everything we're doing. <laughs> so we're, we're, ready to, we're ready to catch uh, SN9 fly. So let's see if that's actually the case. Um, obviously not tonight, but after static fire. Um, Harvey James, thank you so much for your tip. I appreciate that. This is from um, H Mass Lighting. Hey, Tim. Uh, what's your thoughts on the new Chinese space station launching this year? Actually, I don't know too much about it. I definitely would like to read up on it. I think that'd be fantastic. I think anything, you know, uh, friendly or unfriendly that happens. I know that there's a lot of opinions about China. Obviously, there's some uh, grave human rights concerns from from the country. But as far as exploration and science, they are pushing boundaries faster than we are. I hate to, or catching up at least they're accelerating their their exploration and their and their their space abilities and in general i feel like nasa's kind of just maintained and kind of just keep kept doing the same thing whereas china seems to be ramping up so i hope that that puts a lot of uh comp competitiveness um and hopefully in, in a less civil or a cold war era way and more of just a friendly competition i would love to see collaboration as well i would love to see international ventures with china as well just like we started doing uh with you know with russia and the international space station and all other international parties i would love to see china get in on that myself um and i would love to see them make awesome space stations and do really cool things that but that's just me i'm hashtag team space let's play base says um was here for sn9 or sn8 launch uh, streamed it while at work. I hope you take a vacation around the moon in the future. It starts here. You rocked it. Well, thank you so much. Let's play base. Um, yes, SN8 was awesome. That was awesome. I hope SN9 sticks it because that will be unbelievable. That will be the coolest thing ever, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I, I just don't, I'm kind of prepared for it. Like I'm, I'm thinking they made it so much further. SN8 made it so much further and did so much better than I expected that I really hope they just nail it with, with SN9. So we will see. Um, oops. I, Harvey James says, I said SN8 and not SN9 about my tweet about streaming. I can't get over that. I said SN8 so many times that my fingers just default to SN, <laughs> just simply default to, uh, to SN8 now. So saying SN9 and typing out SN9, is just not something that I'm used to saying. I have to get, have to get used to it. So I'm sorry. 
Um, this is from Augustine says, Augustine says, how uh, the, will the Starship come back from Mars without stage one? Well, luckily, Mars has a much, much lower gravity. It's only 30 percent that the gravity of Earth. Um, it also has a lot lower atmosphere. So you can basically get off of Mars and almost immediately or potentially even take off from Mars with. I mean, you could use vacuum engines on the surface of Mars because it's only one percent atmosphere. Vacuum optimized engines will work no problem on the surface of Mars. But um, likely just if it's full of fuel, even at 38% gravity, you might actually be able to take off purely with three vacuum optimized Raptors. Um, so it, it, yeah, it, it takes a lot less Delta V to get off of Mars. It takes actually less Delta V to get back to Mars from Earth because you're at an apogee going down. So that's, uh, it takes less energy to do so than uh, down going up, if I recall, or is it about the same? It might be the same. That Delta V maneuver might be the same. Someone remind me. Um, let's see here. Let's. I'm just kind of watching here, making sure we're not missing anything. Uh, new member, Team 34. Thank you so much. And don't forget members and Patreon members, of course. Uh, we do exclusive live streams. And you guys will probably get a little bit more insight on the things we're working on down here. We've been very busy working on... Uh, more than what you see. There's a lot more going on always behind the scenes than just what you're seeing. So um, I'm sorry that the videos are at a halt right now. You know, we did the, the best space flight events. We did the Astro Awards this year uh, in between SN8 and SN9. That was the only video I could crank out in that time. And that we cranked, we cranked on that. That was a no sleep type of situation to get that out in time. Um, but, you know, there's a lot going on behind the scenes and it really does. And it means that we, I can't work on my other videos. It means, we're doing stuff that I think will be better for, for this in the future, will be better for um, the channel and for the community in the future. And I can't wait to get back on videos. I still cannot wait to make the video about the Soviet rocket engines because it's going to be the best video I've ever made. And I can say that very confidently. Um, and I'm just excited about the subject matter because it's a really cool subject. And I finally understand it and I'm excited to share it with you guys. So, um, yeah, but in the meantime, uh, we're, we're working on some really, really fun stuff. So I hope you guys are here to stick around and, and check it all out. Um, Eric, send him to Mars. Send him to Studio B. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, Luke Ketchin says, uh, how will the belly flop work on other planets? Does the different gravity or air pressure make a difference? It sure does. Uh, obviously, the moon, you can't do a belly flop maneuver. There's no discernible atmosphere to be able to utilize. But on Mars... Here's the thing. People don't necessarily understand, you know, why are they practicing this maneuver here on Earth when on Mars it's going to be totally different? That's true to a degree, but you can still model all of the, you know, we know the atmospheric conditions on Mars. And at hypersonic velocities, when you're coming in from an interplanetary, uh, you know, aerobrake maneuver on the surface of, or not on the surface, but in the atmosphere of Mars, you're going so fast that you're experiencing very similar heating. You're experiencing very similar uh, amounts of essentially air pressure because the the small amount of air can't get out of the way fast enough and, and compresses and, and creates heat it also uh is what can slow the vehicle down that you know that heat is exchanged for uh exchanging kinetic energy the kinetic energy is exchanging itself for heat in the compression of the air and that's that happens on the mars in the in, in the same way the flight profile will be different of course on on earth you know that'll be a much higher altitude where they're doing most of the re-entry and it'll fall for a long time at terminal velocity starship will fall on earth for you know substantial amount of time at terminal velocity at mars they'll want to get as close to the surface as they can while still flying you know mostly 90 degrees to the to the airstream and only do that flip and the belly flop to tail down uh at the very last second there's a chance it might almost never go completely perpendicular to the ground uh there are of course SpaceX did some uh, real physics simulations uh, back for the 2018 uh, Dear Moon project. They showed us what the re-entry profile of that older design would look like, the, the three-fin version. And it is it is basically you know straight on to the wind stream. And then once it gets slower and slower and slower, they did kind of do this for a little bit, do a little bit of a belly flop, and then tail, uh, you know, belly flop to tail down. So um, it's a similar thing. It's just there's less atmosphere to, to bleed off energy. So there will still be... Um, a pretty substantial landing burn on Mars. But luckily, again, uh, they they don't have to do uh, nearly, you know, because it's 38% gravity, it doesn't take nearly as much 
Delta V just as far as gravity dragon and cutting off your your velocity from gravity so all right so here we go this is from from Riggs thank you so much for the chat I appreciate that um, let's see here um, yeah I think the end of the window is about eight o'clock from what I can tell also we had a little tweet here from Elon let's make sure he's not telling us anything important because sometimes he does um, all right Ooh, Elon's mentioning photography about Dragon, saying one day we will get a camera up there that also shows the star field in the background. Now, for that, you have to be uh, on the dark side. You have to be in the shadow of the Earth. You can't do a daylight exposure of Dragon. You can do multi-exposures of Dragon and do a daylight image, you know, for a short shutter speed, you know, uh, low ISO, and then on the but you know, and then do another exposure and, and be able to actually expose the stars. And then just composite the two. But the other option is is do it in the shadow. Do it in the shadow where it's essentially nighttime. Shoot dragon at, uh, up, you know, in the shadow of Earth, and you'd get some incredible images, and it'd be awesome. So, all right, this is from uh, Ryan Blair. Says thank you, Tim, so much. Uh, which SN do you think will stick the landing? Ryan, I'm actually feeling pretty good about SN nine. Honestly, I think. I, I don't see any reason why it, it won't stick the landing. I mean, honestly, I think they learned enough, and it went so well for SNA. If the header tank hadn't lost pressure, and I think they have the, a temporary solution to it, it's a little bit of a Band-Aid, but they know what they're doing. And I, I don't see any reason now, unless a new issue pops up, that it won't just absolutely stick the landing. SNA would have absolutely stuck the landing had it had enough fuel pressure to get it. So um, let's see here. So Harry Games... Uh, by the end of the year, with all of Tim's Super Chat money, he'll be able to have his own TV show. Well, Harry, I did actually do a traditional production in 2018. I shot a series with Facebook. So Facebook Watch at the time, they had original programming just like Netflix and all that stuff. They were trying to do original programming. I did a series. I did a full series that was paid and like a full-blown, legit production. And I'm not doing that again. I don't want a TV series. Why would I put something on TV at this point? I, we have the audience here. You guys are here. You're more dedicated. It's it's finely tuned to exactly what you guys want, or hopefully exactly what you guys want. And um, we, uh, yeah, I, at this point, there's there's no reason to, to go backwards. I feel like TV is dying. Obviously, we're seeing things like Peacock, you know, TV networks going into online only. Um, I think that that's the future and I think it's just going more and more so that way. So I see absolutely no reason. I don't want, a, I don't want a TV show. Like I, it would be a waste of my time I'm already having a hard enough time producing the content that I want to produce. Um, even if I had a big team, even if I had a full blown team, it's so important to me that I'm learning the subject matter. That's why, uh, when ghost Rider in discord, uh, Ryan and I, and then the rest of the discord and then Andrew and I, and all this stuff have been working on the Soviet rocket engine video for a while. It's important to me that I don't just have someone else do the research because I want to know what we're talking about here. I want to know it inside and out as best I can. And you just can't do that if you let someone do all of the research. So <laughs> how's it going, Seth? Good to see you in here. I'm glad that Seth is there. Yes. All right. Let's keep going. And thank you so much. That was that, That's awesome of you, though, Harry. I, I appreciate that. Uh, this is from Sean. Random question. Um, ever see a kid age three in the press area for launch? Trying to film a launch from Pad 40 near Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, wondering about access. So um, there, you you won't be able to bring minors unless you're really high up. You won't be able to bring minors in for any reason um, like that. It's it's quite difficult. Ask John Kraus what it's like to try to do stuff as a minor um, on Air Force bases, but. Um, but Kennedy, or sorry, vehicle assembly. I was thinking, sorry, I was thinking Vandenberg Air Force Base. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, wait, Vandenberg. <laughs> okay, yes, near vehicle assembly building. Um, you won't really be able to. I mean, unless Sean, if you work for NASA and you have access, you're not unless that or working for the press, you won't be able to get anywhere near the VAB. You'll probably your closest physical location would be. Uh, would be the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. And that's actually not a very good view. 
I think one of the best views from what I can tell is across the banana river in Titusville. Um, but yeah. Well, the bus tour. Yeah. Yeah. You can get right up. But as far as trying to film a launch, um, from pad 40 near vehicle assembly building. Um, but yeah, you, you unfortunately will not find kids on site. You won't find, you know, again, if you, if you're Elon, you can bring your kids out to a launch. If you're, Really high up, you can normally find, or not really high, but I think if you work directly for NASA, you might be able to figure something out. So, um, yeah. So, it's, uh, otherwise, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a good answer there. I'm sorry, Sean. Uh, Jordan says, where will Starship primarily launch from once operational? I believe that this, you know, it'll it'll be, I think once totally operational, it'll be a sea launch, period. Like, I don't see any reason why they're going to try launching it from land all the time. It just... They'll be it'll be way easier for them to launch at sea. Hopefully, it's close enough they can still see it from uh, from the land. I will be really, 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 really bummed. But uh, yeah, I, I I don't know honestly. I'll I'll be really bummed if we can't see the sea launch platform from land and without like a super tall tower. You know, maybe we'll have to build like um, you know what's uh, like the Burj Khalifa or something to be able to get a high enough vantage point. But I'll be really bummed. So hopefully. They do have it close enough, but at the, at the same time, the getting far, far enough away from civilization that you're not just having insane amounts of noise pollution is also the big reason to do that, too. So we will see. It'd be something like, you know, 10 miles, so 16 kilometers would be like the bare minimum. I think they'd want to push it out into the into the sea. So I, but I think, you know, once operational, I think they'll fly from here from from the Gulf quite a bit. I think they'll fly from Kennedy Space Center off the off the coast of Kennedy Space Center or maybe right at Kennedy Space Center for certain missions, too. So. Yeah, we will see. We will see. Uh, Ryan uh, Collier says, Tim, what is what is the most underrated rocket, in my opinion? The most underrated rocket, in my opinion, past or present or both. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and include all historical rockets. Most underrated rocket. Man. I mean, from what I know about it, uh, Energia or. Yeah, Energia is how I think how you pronounce it. I still forget, even though I'm doing been doing research on it for so long. Uh, Energia is still, I mean, just because it only flew twice, it's hard to really appreciate it and have hard to treat it as rated as high as it probably deserves to be. Because Energia was insane. Energia was would have been, you know, almost it was more powerful than their N1 moon rocket. It was it had more capability than the N1 moon rocket. So it was insane. It was. What, I think it's the second most powerful rocket ever. Second most capable uh, rocket ever. So uh, not most powerful, but second most capable because it was more efficient, used a lot of hydrogen and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, uh, I, think, I think that that would be a very underrated rocket. And unfortunately, it never flew enough to be able to actually be well-loved and well-appreciated, <laughs> which is why I'm excited to do a video about it there, that, that talks about it a lot. Uh, Josh Bickett, um, Tim, thanks for expanding interest in space and sharing the excitement with so many. Well, thank you very much, Josh. I appreciate you saying hi, and this is my absolute uh, dream job. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so thanks for saying hi. Uh, Vinny Martino says, in such a negative time, you are providing a great escape into the positive that is happening. I plan to go out there this year. Thank you. Well, Vinny, thank you for saying that. That's the thing. One of the things. One of the things that I just absolutely love about spaceflight is, that, again, is something positive to look forward to, something that we can be excited about, something we can, you know, uh, a little bit of shining bright light of inspiration. And uh, yeah, I, this is absolutely what I think is a lot more important than. Uh, I mean, politics and, and human rights and things like that are huge issues, and they're vital like these are, are life changing for people or life ending for people you know these are big topics and big issues but at the same time in 100 200 300 years um i know i know where i can make the biggest impact and i know for me it's it's trying to be as tuned in to space flight and helping get people excited about coming together and uniting over exploration i just really do think that that's something that space flight does is it, it unites us over a common interest and a common bond so um I think that's important. I think that's my current role in life. Uh, not necessarily to be some like, uh, I'm the one that's space flight or anything, but that's just my, my love, my interest, my, my energy all goes into it. And I just don't think I have that much passion about anything else in life. So why not get excited about something like this? Right? Uh, this is from, uh, 
uh, Veritas Coyote says, do you have any opinions on 3D printed fuel? One example is rocket crafters, uh, Legos and laughing gas. So uh, I do have some opinions. I, I don't quite see... I haven't quite found a, so you can use uh, hybrid engines. Of course, you can use nitrous oxide um, or just nitrous. But um, let's see our other feed here real quick, Andrew. Yeah, are we getting? Doesn't seem to be that much more venting, but it might be. Does seem about the same. We'll see. Um, but as far as, uh, I just don't quite see the need, like why 3d print your rocket engine? What, uh, as far as having, cause basically what this is, is a high, it's a hybrid rocket engine. So it uses solid fuel. They 3d print kind of the engine and then they basically blast it with, with nitrous or nit or nitrous oxide. And that's how it therefore becomes a, you can, it's basically like a solid rocket booster that you can throttle, but you can also 3d print them to be exact specifications and exact sizes. But um, I haven't quite found the need for it yet. I don't. I haven't been sold on why that's better than a traditional solid rocket motor or a traditional hybrid motor. I get the the benefits of a hybrid motor. You can turn it off. That's what Virgin Galactic uses on their on their vehicle. But as far as three D printed, I, I don't quite get the, the benefit there. Now, of course, I see the benefit for three D printing a liquid rocket engine, where there's a lot of intricate pieces and manifolds and little orifices and all these very intricate pieces. Oh, here we go. They might be going for the very end of the window. So let's set that clock to 8 o'clock. There we go. We are seeing something, my friends. We are seeing something. Want to um, update them real quick? Hang on. Um, Got it. Okay. Um, so yeah, there we go. So that's 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 my opinion on three D printed full blown fuels like that. Basically, um, I don't quite see the need for it, but three D printed ro liquid rocket engines, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Roger Manley, uh, thanks Tim and team for giving us a front row seat. Love the enthusiasm. Well, thanks for tuning in, Roger. Again, for those of you just now watching, if you happen to be tuning in, there's a handful more of you right now. This is going to be a relatively boring event. This is going to be a static fire where they're holding the rocket down. They light all three of the Raptor engines that are underneath it. So this is, again, of course, this is Starship serial number nine. This is a prototype Starship vehicle. Starship's eventual goal is to get humans to Mars. That's not a joke. That is the actual ambition of this rocket. And they're going to hold it down, uh, put some fuel in it, put some liquid methane and liquid oxygen inside of its tanks. And then they're going to light the three Raptor engines, hopefully successfully, for about three seconds is all. So we'll see. Uh, when it does light, we'll see a big orange flash. You'll see a bunch of smoke go up because it just kind of goes everywhere after it lights. And then you'll see the smoke go away. What is... Oh, do we see a, lo a little light flashing there? Got it. Um, so, yeah, they. Um, that's what we're hoping to see tonight. It, it's not going to be... These aren't that spectacular, but it's a great milestone knowing that SN9 is looking to fly. And they're trying to fly it uh, as early as the 14th. There's uh, there's, there's uh, TFRs and basically flight. We're, we're thinking Thursday would be the earliest. If this happens tonight, they might be able to launch it because today is Tuesday in the U.S. Central. So um, they could fly it Thursday. They could fly it Friday. Um, we don't know. We've heard rumors and people keep saying things like they don't test on weekends, which is kind of true. But I, I don't know. If, they haven't really done many testing, but I, I don't think they can't. I think they just kind of try not to. So we will see. Uh, this is from Scott. Uh, uh, Tim, thank you and the crew for all you do in the face of constant uncertainty. Will SpaceX's relationship with media like you continue to be from a distance, or will they let you get closer and get more info eventually? Well, they give us a t Elon gives us an insane amount of insight and, and info about this vehicle. We've had information about this vehicle that we haven't had from any vehicle ever i mean we're, we're seeing we're learning more about this than we frankly should almost at this point he, it's oh not quite but i mean he does tell us an insane amount of stuff and um they they're playing you know pretty pretty nice i i feel like honestly you know i feel like they're they're being pretty generous with with not you know totally shooing out 
uh, press. They let people go right up to the pad on the, you know, on, on public property. They're, they're being extremely generous with what is an extremely advanced rocket. You know, this could be all hidden away. They could be doing all this somewhere where no one could be seeing, you know, uh, on an Air Force base or um, somewhere in the middle of the desert where they could have, you know, control over everything and not let anybody see it. But the fact that they're doing it here is incredible because now we can actually bring it to you guys and 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 bring you guys along for the ride. And and that's uh, that's quite special, in my opinion. So um, I think they're already doing a great job and I really appreciate everything that they allow us to do. But it's important also for the media to not push the boundaries. You know, we're uh, I'm everyone around here, everyone that, that I've ever interacted with out here, you know, of course the crew from NASA space flight, who's unbelievable, you know, they're easily some of the hardest working people I know as well. You know, Mary, obviously Boca Chica gal and, and Jack who comes out here a lot too. Um, and then just the team that helps put on the whole webcast and stuff. I mean, uh, everyone that I've talked to from that camp is super understanding. We're all in agreement of let's not ever push the boundaries of, of what's smart and safe. We don't want to risk, the launch license, we don't want to set a bad example as far as, you know, how to safely watch this rocket. Um, and there's a lot of other people out here, too, that have all been so far very respectful of the boundaries and of the the rules and everything. And I think that's extremely important. From from now on, I think we absolutely need to be making sure we're setting um, a good example of that because we don't want to be, you know, SpaceX could put the hammer down and say, like, nope, sorry, we're going to totally block the road. I mean, it's actually really hard because it is a public road and it's a public beach. So they'd probably have a hard time doing it, but you could, they could really be strict about, um, you know, who they allow to upcoming launches and things like that. If they, if they wanted to, but they've been really, really cool about it. So, um, a shoe says, um, why does starship need to refuel in space when super heavy booster does all the heavy lifting to get it to space? Well, a shoe, don't forget there's a difference between getting to space and staying in space. The booster isn't even close to orbital velocity. The booster, even if, you know, uh, when it lets go of the upper stage, there's a reason the upper stage has to do uh, like six more minutes of lighting its engines and draining almost all of its fuel or virtually all of its fuel um, is because it takes that much to actually stay in space. So you can go to space by just going straight up and coming back down and go up, you know, 62 miles, 100 kilometers. You're, you're in space, the arbitrary Kármán line, basically, but you'd fall right back down. So to stay in space, you have to you have to basically be going really really fast sideways, just like if you throw a ball, right? If you threw a ball, even you know if you're a really good, you know, if you have a strong arm, you can make a ball go really far. But obviously gravity will pull it back down. A bullet kind of can go quite a bit further because you know it's going so fast that it essentially it does it's not like it's outrunning gravity. It's just that it travels a lot more time uh, before gravity pulls it down because it's going so fast. So from point A to point B. Eventually, it's going to hit the ground, right? Because gravity's pulling down on it. Gravity's still pulling down on the booster when it lets go. And the booster comes right back down at 9.8 meters per second squared. And, well, slightly less because it's a little bit higher and you have a little bit of uh, square inverse law reduction in, in gravity. But, long story short, in order to actually get in space and stay in space, you do have to be going sideways really fast. And we're talking, it's, you know, about 17,000 miles an hour, about 28,000 kilometers an hour. It's, it's really, 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 really fast. And uh, so when the booster lets go, uh, it, it turns around and comes back. Dry venting has started. I have not seen that yet. I should probably be paying more attention. Um, that's a good sign. If dry venting just started, we should probably push our clock back a little bit. Andrew, let's go 803. ish but i haven't also seen a tribe either but so um so the, the point is 150 metric tons is about the limit of what the upper stage can get into orbit if it you know if it had to if it's pushing any more it wouldn't actually be able to get into orbit that means you can put 150 extra tons of something that doesn't have instead of a payload you can just replace that with fuel dock up to another one and just continue to refuel it a super heavy booster, if it tried to get itself into orbit, would have nothing left over and likely wouldn't get into orbit at all yet. So, um, yeah, that's why that's why Starship needs to refuel in space um, because it, it still takes almost all of Starship's fuel to actually get into orbit. So super heavy uses a lot of fuel to get up into space to get above the discernible atmosphere and inject a decent amount of velocity. But it comes back empty. You know, it comes back basically empty. So, yeah, hopefully that 
that helps. I don't know if I made any sense there. <laughs> Uh, Tector Audios says, um, hope to visit Boca Chica someday in life to also make content, but now we have your team. So keep it up um, and almost a million subs. Well, thank you, Tector. We are getting close. I would love if it happened to work out that we hit a million. Um, I don't think it's going to happen, but February 27th, 2017 is the first time I made a scripted video on YouTube where I stood in front of the camera and told you about a space flight event. It happened to actually be when they announced that two people uh, were planning to go around the moon on Falcon Heavy and Dragon. Um, there we go. Okay. So now we're probably about 15 out. 14 out. Let's go ahead and go. Let's go 804. <laughs> Sweet. All right. I love it. That's the engine chilling. They're beginning to chill down the rafters. So, um, yeah, I, I, it'd be great, uh, if it would happen that I'd reach a million by that four year milestone, like the fourth year of on the dot of doing YouTube videos would be awesome. The beginning of the fourth year, or however you'd say it, fourth year. Yeah. Four year anniversary. There we go. of doing YouTube videos. I would love that. That'd be really, really cool, but it doesn't matter in the long run. It's a very arbitrary number, but it'd be fun to, it'd be fun to do that. We'll see. Um, Christopher Clausen, thank you so much. Hey Tim, put this towards your tech studio. Uh, can't wait for Starship to be a weekly or daily occurrence. It's feeling like that's going to be happening pretty soon. I mean, like in a couple years. I feel like in two or three years, there's a chance the stuff will be um, will be just happening constantly. You know, we'll have test launches. Even Starship by the end of the year, there's a chance we might be seeing something every two weeks, right? So uh, pretty exciting times. Can't wait. Um, and thank you so much. That was, that was really generous, Christopher. So thank you. Uh, Arthur Morgan says... Uh, Tim, would you ever seriously consider and be willing to ride the Starship, assuming the program is success and it was reasonably priced? I would ride on it after, you know, in 15, 20 years after it's proven to be reliable and safe for humans. I would consider it. I absolutely would consider it. But I don't want to be anywhere near it when it's in a development state. Okay, so let's see. I think our, our time's pretty reasonable. But we'll see. Um, all right, and just for, for people that are, are wondering, I don't, I don't want to live in Boca Chica, or well, obviously not Boca Chica because you really can't buy a place. But you know, even South Padre or Bronzeville or, um, or any of that stuff, I don't really want to live here. Um, I do want to be here quite a bit though, and I want to be able to cover this stuff as best I can. Um, I have a really great life at my in my hometown in in Iowa, and I, I like being there. I have great friends and family. And that's quite important to me, but it is also important to me to cover this. I'm trying to kind of balance those two things. So I don't necessarily want to live here, but that's why we're kind of working on something that I think will be a good solution. So I'll, I'll let you guys know about that uh, soon. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for the membership. Uh, is awesome. You will stay tuned for some live streams. Uh, Slow Dancing with a Mongoose. I love that name. What are the chances of SpaceX painting Starship Electric Mucus Green and stamping it uh, Plan X. Uh, I don't, I don't quite get it, but yeah. What Plan X? What am I missing? Is that a? Do you know that joke? That reference? I'm sorry. Oh wait, like Mucinex? <laughs> I feel like that'd be like, if it was, <laughs> yeah. But I don't know about Plan X. Uh, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Whatever. <laughs> this is from uh, Dude AM Productions. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. This is from uh, Tim Copen says, Tim, as I, as a skydiver and wearing a tight fitting jumpsuit, which I'll bet is uh, close to the surface to the, which, which I bet is close to the surface to weight of a nearly empty starship. I can get better than a one to one horizontal movement. Yeah, you're right. I mean, with a squirrel suit uh, or, you know, full with a good jumpsuit, I'm, you probably can. And you're probably right. Starship probably can get beyond a one to one glide ratio. Um, but um, ooh, look at how look at how frosty that baby is. I love it. That's looking good. Um, it probably can. But as far as like properly flying and gliding, I'd really hesitate to call it gliding. I would really hesitate to call it gliding. 
you know, it probably could for a brief amount of time, but it really would stall extremely uh, at high at a really high speed would stall because uh, it doesn't really provide traditional lift using um, pr traditional aero services. So, all right, let's keep going here. Um, this is from Ec oh I see Planet Express. That was oh that's I did not realize that was sorry that's Plan X. I did not realize that. Okay. Sorry, thank you. I under, I understand now. Okay, from um, Echimus Maximus says, can you tell uh, Little Miss Anna Banks to go to bed and promise her she can watch your video tomorrow? Listen, Anna, you need to go to bed. You can watch this in the morning. I promise. Uh, it sounds like sounds like uh, your your parent there. I'm, it sounds like maybe your dad will allow you to see what happened in the morning. So, don't worry. Uh, we are gonna see just a quick static fire. But you know what? I'm gonna. Uh, Echimus, Maximus, there's only five minutes, man. Come on. Just just five minutes. Let her let her see a little static fire, you know, maybe just be like the cool dad for just a second. And then and then Anna, you go right to bed. I don't care. No excuses after that. Right to bed. Alright. Um this is from uh Razenbot. Uh this the space shuttle heat shield was very expensive to maintain, right? Wouldn't this be a problem also for Starship? Well, um let's see, the uh the problem with the space shuttle was that all the heat tiles were completely, basically unique. There was almost no uniformity to it at all. There was really no way, you know, all of the different things. So they had to check each and every single 24,000 of them. They were also made out of silica, which is extremely fragile, had to be glued onto the bottom of the shuttle. It was not a very robust solution starships are going to be physically bolted they're mostly going to be uniform because most of the body is just that round cylinder you know a tapered cylinder when it starts tapering they'll have to do something a little bit more special and for the hinges and the flaps but for the most part for the most part um it's it's way more uniform and they're using tough rock which is a completely it's a slightly it, it can ablate which the space shuttle tiles did not it'll be su substantially more reusable tougher bolted on more uniform, uh, 21st century, so we can use automated checkouts, you know, like a, a, a robot arm with a camera on it that can scan everything automatically. People have to, had to use to scan them. Eventually, they had a, a scanner for the shuttle. Before, originally, it was like hand look at every single 24,000 tile. Eventually, they did get this cool, like, scanner th scanner tool thing. But, um, yeah, it's uh, I think they're making a lot of improvements to a heat shield compared to the space shuttle. That um that I think will be help make it more reusable and cheaper in the long run. So, yeah, good good question though. Um, uh, ND Mion, ten degrees Celsius. So you're saying t-shirt weather, huh? <laughs> you know what? I should be, that that should be me too. And in Iowa right now, it's it's well below zero Celsius. Uh, so I shouldn't be complaining. But when there's a really cold sea breeze and it's and it's ten degrees or five degrees and stuff like that, it is very 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 cold. So, yeah, um, we're guys, don't forget our our clock is a pretty rough estimate here um, of three ish minutes. It could be before that. So starting in about a minute, we really should be paying attention, keeping our eyes glued here. Remember, the static fire is going to be very short. It's only going to be about three seconds in duration if it goes well. And uh, and that's it. That's all we're going to have is about three seconds. Sounds like the sirens are going off now. Um have you are you able to hear ambient audio out there okay okay but hopefully hopefully we're getting somewhere okay harvey james um says you put sna and sn9 in your tweet about streaming don't think sna is reusable anymore yes i i realized i did make an error but you know what i'm just i'm just too excited to, to fix it and I just love SN8 too much to, to even try typing SN9 too much. You're going to see me say that a lot. I will accidentally say SN8 a lot. I guarantee it. Alright, this is from um, Harvey. Love that SpaceX make the, these public. Well, they don't really have a choice, unfortunately. Um, you know, realistically they are uh, they're doing this in a public space and near a lot of populated areas, so they don't really have too much of a choice, which is great for us. And I, th I don't think they mind it either because it does bring up a lot of attention. It brings up a lot of excitement for what they're doing. And it's, quite frankly, a really big tool to to allow the public to be engaged and be excited. So 
Yeah. So I, I don't think that they're they're not necessarily like, hey, here we are, uh, hoping to do this, you know, or, or bringing this to you, because otherwise they would be streaming all these things. But they aren't really hiding their rockets either. So and and the progress here of Starship. So. All right, so here we go, guys. We're getting really close. We're, we're probably within about a minute or so, so we really need to be tuning in. I'm going to try looking out the window and see. I'm actually going to open up this, too, so we can really hear it. Oh, that's cold. Oh, well, I want to hear if maybe I should open it after we see it because it'll take, it'll take a while to get here. <laughs> it's really cold. I'm also just a wuss, an Iowan that should be used to... Um, <laughs> All right, it should be used to cold. I'm scared and sad. Oh man! And one last one here before I'm probably just gonna tune in here and start paying attention. But Jay Jay Humphrey is laughing at human money. <laughs> yeah, coffee money is great, and I love coffee money. Trust me, but um, you can't quite always pay bills with coffee. So here we go, guys. I think we're any second. So get ready to pay attention. I'm actually just gonna look out the window. Uh, it's it's quite dark, but I should be able to see it. Hopefully. Famous last words. Want to come check it out, Andrew? Oh, yeah, yeah. Could be any second, guys. So don't forget, this will be really short. And hopefully all it is is the engine's lighting. And that's it. It'll just light up for about three seconds. Should be any second. <laughs> the anticipation. The anticipation is killing me. Come on, baby. Come on, we need the static fire. Come on, baby, please. <laughs> There's the drone. I just saw the drone fly through the shot. Come on, baby. I'm like glued to this. I hope you guys are ready. If this goes well, we could see a flight here like Thursday or Friday, so... Um, or hopefully within two to three days after this. So fingers crossed big time. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. We're seeing venting. Here we go. Oh, is this going to be a D tank? Uh, oh. That's D tanking. That is a scrub. Yep. You know what to do. That is not a static fire, my friends. Quick friendly reminder, this is still a very developmental vehicle with a temperamental, you know, relatively new ground tank system, relatively new launch pad. They haven't launched from this pad B yet. Uh, new systems, you know, every time they're flying and tanking this thing, it is still an experiment. It is still, uh, you know, something that's relatively new. And normally we just wouldn't see these, these, these growing pains, you know, these little, these little pains in development, but we are, it is very public because we're tuned into this and we have cameras pointed at it like crazy. So although this sucks, the vehicle's still standing. Um, it doesn't look like it was quite a full detank. So um, it might be scrubbed. It might. Uh, who knows, guys? Who knows if they'll, they might, you know, they're, the road is supposed to open at eight. So, oh man, we will see. Well, uh, I've got more questions to answer, I guess, while we see what happens. 
This is the old uh, watching paint dry with everyday astronaut. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> From uh, Joseph Gates says, uh, for your Gulfstream 6, for rapid deployment to any launch or at least your Boca Chica studio. Thank you so much, honestly. Uh, any thoughts on CL number 15 doing high altitude flight for heat shield and high speed reentry? I think that's exactly, I think that's what they're going to want to do for CL number 15. I think CL number 15 will be the first time they're like, hey, let's actually get this thing to really high altitudes uh, and high velocities. And what they could do, this is, if you go back to 2018 at the Falcon Heavy demo flight, so February, almost exactly three years ago, Elon said this year even, uh, what he said was, uh, he said next year, so 2019, he said we'll do some, you know, kind of small little hops with, with a Starship. So that was Starhopper. He said then the next year we'll hopefully do some higher flights. That was seal number five and six, which were still the same height. But then, of course, seal number eight was a higher flight. Then he said hopefully after that we start going you know, flying away and turning around and actually accelerating back towards the launch pad um, or the landing pad and actually like doing, testing the, the re-entry heating and actually getting a sense of, of how the tiles are holding up. So they are, they are doing little spurts of detanking. But so hopefully, you know, there's another one. Um, they, by the way, sometimes, you know, when it's, when it's fueled up like this, um, they, they sometimes do try to go for another attempt, depending on the circumstances. And, of course, we don't have insight on the circumstances, so we don't necessarily know. There is, of course, always still a small chance they could try to go tonight again. But the more and more we see of that, that is the more and more they are detanking. So, less and less likely. Um, but, yeah, I do think seal number 15 might be the first one to go way up and out, fly east over the, the gulf get up to an altitude of you know 100 100 kilometers plus which would mean it would need more than three raptors it would need uh it'd probably need six sea level raptors to do that test which would be a pretty big milestone uh because they'd have to fill it so right now three raptors cannot lift a fully fuel starship vehicle it needs six to be able to actually lift itself pretty much off the ground and uh so we'd have to have six raptors that'd be pretty much full and then it could probably do something like 100 kilometers or more. So that would be what I would love to see from SN15 would be something like that. But it would be really interesting to see a starship with six raptors flying because that would be – don't forget, with just three raptors, it's getting close to as powerful as a Falcon 9 booster. Close. Uh, not quite, but uh, it's getting there. So about four raptors would be pretty close to a tipping point and have as much power as an entire Falcon 9 booster. So six raptors would be um, – not the most powerful rocket that SpaceX has flown, because, of course, Falcon Heavy is more powerful still. But it'd be getting up there. It'd be a, a fun milestone. Aaron Speck says, Haven't been able to join many streams late, live lately, so I just wanted to say, Hey, Tim, and go Hawks. Thank you, Aaron. Good to hear from you again. Uh, thanks for Thank you for the tip. I really appreciate that. Uh, from Jeffrey Tripp, um, Will you interview Elon after this serial number nine launch? I don't know. I don't know. We're trying. They're trying. Uh, schedules are very complicated right now, so we will see. We will see. Um, yeah, there's nothing on the on the calendar yet, but we know for a fact that, that they want to. Of course, I want to, so we will see. Uh, Musical Wolves, how is a mission control protected during a static? How is mission control protected during static? Well, mission control is far enough from static fire that it's no problem. Mission control is uh, about two and a half miles, so about four kilometers or so. So it's really not a big deal, um, but launch days is a, a little bit a little bit sketchier. But for static fire, you know, we've even had seen really big booms like serial number four, and it was fine for um, you know for mission control. So yeah, um, this is from Tim Hester says uh, it's a new member from Tim Hester. Thank you so much for your membership. I appreciate that. Uh, Brian Banks, thank you. Wow. Uh, Tim, do you actually have Elon's cell number? <laughs> Love you, bro. No comment, but thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate that. Uh, you are awesome. From Thomas Wham says, could SpaceX use an equatorial Galapagos Island as an operations base? So here's the thing. It, it comes down to how much performance do you gain from a little bit further south latitude and how much, you know, could you gain two, three, four percent payload? Versus how much more money does it cost to run a, se a separate launch pad on the other side of the world? And getting Starship there, getting 
personnel there, getting fuel there, all of the things that logistically we take for granted here um, with Texas or with Florida or with California uh, or anywhere else, really, you know, when there's infrastructure, how much launch infrastructure and, and assets are there in the Galapagos Islands? So that's kind of the trade off is like, sure, you might get three or four percent more. First off, is there a demand for three or four percent more performance in this particular rocket? If not, you know, if there is, how much more can you make? Can you fly it enough to make enough money to pay off all of the additional complications and logistics of flying from the Galapagos Islands? So, um, yes, of course, they could do that. They could launch equatorially, like kind of French Guiana is a perfect example. They fly Soyuz from French Guiana, and I don't know if it pays off. I don't know the numbers, but I, I have a hard time seeing it honestly pay off. So, yeah, we'll see. Um, I did want to really quickly bring up, though, uh, for you guys, we are doing, uh, we do have 10% off of the Everyday Astronaut Full Flow Stage Combustion merch. Andrew, go ahead and pull it up for one quick second. Uh, use coupon code launch day. Uh, go down to the Full Flow collection here. And these look, stre uh, look stretched on this monitor. <laughs> uh, but you can go ahead and get 10% off of anything in the full, flow com uh, the full Flow collection here by using launch day, all one word, one coupon code, by going to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And we do have a lot of things back in stock, like our drinkware that you guys were, uh, that we had missed out on before because they sold out for the holidays. But now we do have mugs and drinkware and the moon lamps that are twice as big as they were before and lots of new sticker packs and stuff like that too. So if you guys want to help me do what I do and also get some fun stuff for yourself, uh, go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. That means a lot to me. So yeah, thank you. Back to the rocket. And uh, yeah. Uh, the hoodie might have been sold out, but we may have restocked a good amount of them. But we also do still have the shirts. So anything that is in the full flow combustion cycle is on sale for 10% off. So, um, okay, I guess the full flow hoodie is sold out currently, but we're working on restocking that I know for a fact. I thought it maybe had been done already. More detanking, more detanking. All right, from Senna says, uh, would you consider to make a more detailed video about engines, rockets, etc.? I'm studying uh, aero engineering at, at university, so I want to know more, but university won't won't do that yet because I'm still second year. I am making as detailed videos as I can. That's kind of the end of my knowledge. I, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an aerospace engineer. I'm not a scientist. So everything that I know and have learned is from public information. So um, I am incapable of really making any more in-depth videos than like the Raptor engine and the Aerospec engine are about as deep as I get into the actual inner workings of an engine. There's still some more things that I'd love to talk about someday, um, like how to start a rocket engine would be will be a fun one because there's a lot of different ways to start rocket engines. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of fun things to talk about, and we'll get to those in in the, in, a, in future videos. But at this point, I can't make like a more detailed video. Um, I'm, I'm doing as much as I can at this point, but I'll work on it. Senna. I'll try, I'll try for you and I'll try getting even more detailed, uh, you know, about injectors and things like that. But, um, just stay tuned because that's what we try and do on this channel is just make detailed breakdowns of really complicated topics. So Toby Blair says, Tim, after Starship sticks it, uh, what do you think the next step is? I think they'll probably want to stick it again. Honestly, I think they'll want to fly the same profile. Maybe they'll have confidence with the FAA to fly it a little bit higher, but doing that exact, you know, maybe doing 15 or 20 kilometers, like we initially thought they were going to, uh, but do, do mo mostly the exact same thing. Maybe fly a little higher, maybe fly a little faster, and just do that on repeat until they're flying at really high speeds and actually testing the heat shield. So, all right, Gus says, uh, Tim, love the channel. Which Starship do you think will be the first one to do a re-entry? Well, define re-entry, because I think anything, technically anything that would reach atmospheric pressure so really anything over about 50 kilometers is basically re-entering um but you know as far as orbital re-entry i think we'll be at like serial number 22 or something like that um, probably near the 20s for an orbital re-entry i think serial number 15 will, will practice re-entry heating though by turning and burning and coming back uh really fast uh at the at the landing site from a really high altitude so um it's kind of hard to nail that down but i think as far as orbital will be like in the serial number 20. Um, Shannon uh, Peugeot or, or Piggott says, hi, Austin. Uh, Austin's not here with us, but maybe he's in the chat. But if so, hello, Austin. Uh, I Everybody loves a good Austin Bernard. I, I, I assume that's who you're talking about, but yes. 
Um, Joe says, um, so if we don't get static fire today, which we didn't, does that push us back for flight to Friday next week? I think Friday now would probably be most likely, you know, if we get a static fire tomorrow, Wednesday, that does, that does mean, that does mean, uh, Friday, most likely. Um, we don't really have any way of knowing for sure, but that does seem to be the case. It seems to be a day-to-day -day push. So, uh, Jesse, thank you so much for your membership. I appreciate that. Joe says, uh, in the what have you done for me lately category, how is the Russian rocket engine article coming along? I'm looking forward to it. Well, it's more than an article. It'll be a full-blown hour and a half video. This thing is going to be insane. And like I was talking a little earlier on the stream that, um, unfortunately, when we're down here, we're doing a lot of things. It's not I, – I wish it was just us sitting around. We actually did sit around for a little bit last night. Was that last night or two nights ago? It was last night for like maybe a couple hours. Yeah, that was great. That was great. That was like our first time of like not just still doing things. We're constantly working on things and, you know, we're literally working like 14 hour days. That's just kind of how it goes out here. And we're also working on some other things. So we're doing things for the stream, but also working on other opportunities that we're, that we're, that I'm hoping to try to line up for, for everyone. And, um, that means that everything else gets, there's just physically not a minute to work. I did actually sit down a, a little bit ago, uh, two days ago or so. I was working on some of the, the, Last little bits of information. We're still trying really hard to find any info about the RD-150. If you can find, don't send me the astronautics link. Don't send me a little blurb from, there's like only four things out there. on the. If you Google RD-150 and try to send that to me, I'm going to be very mad because, of course, we have done that. Of course, we have looked up as much as we can find about RD-150. But I'm trying to find the lineage from the RD-150, uh, kind of what inspired it, what, what commonality it has with any other engine, whether it be the rd 273 the 275 um anything we don't know or grassman straws to really make any connection to that and then the rd 150 is what spawned the rd 170 which is what we uh which is what spawned the rd 180 which is what the atlas 5 uses in the rd 181 like antares so um getting to the root of where the rd 150 came from would be awesome so um, if you happen to be uh, Russian or can speak and read Russian and can find some of these old articles and stuff talking about, because this was originally developed for the Energia and actually a program slightly before Energia, which I'm forgetting off the top of my head right now, like the YRF series or something. If if you can find where the RD-150 actually came from when Glushko decided to, to take on that instead of the after the N1 program ended, you know, Glushko started developing a, a super heavy lift vehicle himself. So if you know anything about that, Please, 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 please let me know. This is from um, Haran says, uh, permission to start a send him to the moon fund. No, I'd rather, let's let's forget the moon and sending me to anywhere. Let's work on improving this setup here because this setup, like I said, um, I'm not even showing you guys the mess because there is a whole mess of stuff that we're still working on. It's insane. And what we're trying to do is make a place to be able to keep some stuff set up permanently. So that's the goal. That's that's a way better goal to me than um, than going to the moon or Mars because there's a lot more talented people that uh, that could actually do some really good things. I mean, I, someday I would love to go. Sure, sure, sure. But for now, let's focus on this. Let's make the best content we can possibly make. Let's improve my my use of time, Andrew's use of time. Let's improve our use of time, not having to set up everything, have a more permanent home base here. Uh, to be able to to be able to do these coverage for you guys and make a better product in the long run, better quality, without a stress tim that's capable of making more content. So, yeah. So I uh, so uh, Heron or, or Jaren, I, I want to go ahead and say permission denied. This is going to go into Studio B funds. Um, Hoss Garage says love the content. Uh, shooting for my son Vincent. Uh, shout out to my for my son Vincent watching. He loves outer space. He's four years old and wants to go to the moon. Vincent, see why don't we start to send Vincent to the moon fund? If Vincent wants to go to the moon, four years old. By the time Vincent is twenty five or thirty years old, uh, you know there's a real possibility that Vincent can just go to the moon. Just that would be the world that. Vincent lives in. It's just get on Starship, go to the moon in 20, 25 years. So that's why we're streaming. That's why we're trying to bring coverage because that is the future that we're slowly seeing. Well, not slowly, fastly. Uh, but on days like today, it feels like it's slow progress, but it's really fast progress. So um, let's see here. This is from Brian Jones. Hi, Tim. 
Uh, thanks for the channel. How many Starship prototype launches do you think we will see this year? That's a great question. Honestly, I think we'll see... We could see 10. I think we could see 10 prototypes this year. Um, they seem to be set up to be able to launch once a month. So 10 gives some wiggle room for things to not go right. Um, I do think... I think we could see 10. But things never quite go right. And, you know, once they get the first booster out there, there could be a long period of time of trying to figure things out and new connections and stuff like that. So um, maybe... Maybe. We'll see. Um, Elmar says, uh, KSC often opens the beaches at Saturn V Center, or the bleachers at Saturn V Center for launches, but tickets are usually very spendy, like over $150. Yes, that is true. Uh, you are ac absolutely right. Those are the Feel the Heat tickets. Those are probably, especially for a launch from 39A, those are about the best seats in the house. Those are almost as good as the press site even. They're, in some ways, you have a better view from 39A for 39A if you are at the Feel the Heat which is at the Saturn V Center at Kennedy Space Center. I do have a video and an article about where to watch launches from. Sorry, it's old and I'm yelling and I'm in a spacesuit. Never mind it. But uh, yeah, I there is. Uh, I do have kind of a where to watch launches from, a little guide on where and how and what. So yeah, um, don't forget that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, this is Red114. One Tim and crew, thanks for, for uh, from Russia for your work. Uh, for C Start, I think greatest problem is LOX plant and LOX storage. Yeah, uh, that is that is a, a big deal there. So thank you very much, Red114, for, for hanging out with us and and, and thanks for yeah. I, I hope that you look for I hope you're looking forward to the, the Russian video that we're working on because it's going to be awesome, I promise. Because I have a huge, huge, huge uh, fascination and appreciation for these engines now. So all right, uh, Renau says, uh, what do you know about the Chinese methane rocket? Forgot they were developing one until there was a reply on your Twitter regarding the first methane rocket to orbit. Uh, Zhuko2, I don't, I don't honestly know almost anything about that. I really need to brush up. I first need to brush, so now that I'm brushing up on Russia finally, the next one for me to brush up on is actually India. I really want to know as much as I can know about India. Um, and then from there, I want to brush up on China probably would be the, the next one. Or maybe... Or maybe Europe. I feel like I probably owe uh, the Arion series some some love. <laughs> um, Alden says, uh, "What do you think about the idea of building a man-made island or commandeering an old oil rig to build a launch pad and causeway out to the site?" Well, I definitely think an oil rig is basically what they'll be using. I think they'll be using quite literally, basically, an oil rig or a, for a sea launch platform someday. I 100% think that. Uh, and then uh, they'll just take boats out there or helicopters. Maybe even a Hyperloop, if it's the same location that they take it to every single time. Who knows? But I, uh, we know this. We know that Elon's talked multiple times about pursuing sea launch. So it'll definitely be a thing they do. And, uh, yeah, I, I, that's absolutely. From Main Day 6 says, is an in Elon interview going to happen soon? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, it's – well, soon, soon is maybe, but it should happen soon <laughs> i have no idea we keep uh we co keep hoping uh yeah we keep we keep hoping to to to, to do it and uh, we've been in talks and uh trying to figure it out but the logistics of when and how to do that is actually quite difficult with with elon's time as you can imagine you know one of the most important people in the world doesn't just sit around all day waiting to get interviewed so um we will see crafty geek says have you considered a co-stream co-streaming with nasa spaceflight channel dos valdez on twitch or do you have strong preference for doing your own thing well crafty geek um no i've actually popped on their channel before a couple times i, I love the nasa spaceflight crew they are awesome they are uh, you guys know this you guys know they're awesome um and i've, I've popped on there but it, it, on launch days and stuff it makes sense for us to have as much coverage as possible what if a stream goes down what if a camera goes down what if all of these things it, it's important and I, I, I tend to think that all ships rise with the tide is, is my attitude towards spaceflight and, and towards media in general is that I don't necessarily see it as if I'm streaming, I'm taking away from them or vice versa. You know, um, I started streaming, uh, I started streaming stuff from Boca Chica two years ago, uh, really rickety and really poorly, but I, I started doing it about two years ago, uh, before Starhopper ever even did a static fire. I was trying to catch the static fire, came down here and streamed. 
Um, and at the time, you know, that wasn't a thing. And I've never once been upset with the idea of other people streaming because it makes sense. There should be other people streaming. This is cool stuff. And um, I, uh, trying to villainize it or turn it into some kind of arbitrary competition is, is pointless. So I think there should definitely be collaboration. But having all of us have our own streams up, I think, also makes sense. And that way you guys can kind of have a, a control room where you can put up whatever footage you want to see and control the shots yourself too so and can tr control your favorite hosts you know at that point you know you could have multiple streams pulled up be listening to them if you prefer their chatter and their banter they're great you know obviously the the crew there does such a good job of commenting on things um if you want to hear labs crew talking if you want to hear you know uh, my thoughts on stuff like whatever you can you guys get to pick and choose and i think that's kind of the beauty of youtube is we don't have to merge everything together we can have options so that's kind of that's kind of uh, my opinion. So, um, Andre says, "Hey Tim, thanks for the coverage as always. Well, thank you so much for for hanging out." Oh, look at this <laughs> from Ash Daddy. Of course, do you think those fifty pound rabbits? So, what would that be? Twenty two point five kilograms or so, uh, or about that? Check my math. I think it's about twenty two point five. I'll be very excited if I knocked it out of the park. If I just nailed that. Off the top of my head. 22.6. We'll say not bad. We'll say not bad. Okay. So a 22.5 kilogram rabbit uh, would be able to take the G's under an, uh, a normal liftoff. Of course. I think a rabbit would easily be able to handle uh, up to three G's on liftoff. I think that's well within their, their uh, you know, think about how many how much crazy stuff rabbits do already rabbits are just crazy in general so yeah absolutely um hey if we think if they're for, if they're done t and they're not testing tonight okay maybe why don't we um why don't we get them out of there and we can put our other camera up what do you think yeah yeah but they just they don't vent at full speed so they don't cause they always vent it about like this. Yeah. It feels a little slower than normal, but you know, they, they don't they can't just open up the vents and let her rip because of cold freezingness and all of the other considerations. Uh, <laughs> Jack says Tim thinks rabbits are out here breaking two G's. I don't necessarily think they're breaking two G's at any point, but I think their bodies are capable of of uh pretty great feats. I think they're you know pretty athletic i don't know <laughs> from, from uh possessed llama send him to mars what? should we just name this if we get a studio b should i just name it mars yeah okay sure you could go ahead and send me to mars <laughs> thank you very much uh old caroline uh carline caroline carline uh continue the the great work mate can't wait uh to launch can't wait to launch this thing fly uh i can't wait either honestly this is going to be fantastic and uh and that means a lot so hopefully this is just a, an awesome flight so we will see uh hey leo the human no 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 not the rd0150 that's the problem with russian rocket engines 0150 is different than rd150 totally different engine totally different engine uh, okay, I'll answer this one. Jacko, 800. You've been, you've been trying for a while. Uh, what kind of Gs will passengers experience while doing the landing on Mars? It'll be very similar to the landing on Earth. Uh, they'll likely do... Uh, um, it'll be... As far as thrust-to-weight ratio on Mars, it'll be a higher thrust-to-weight ratio, but it'll be a total, like, Earth G, same 3G landing. So, uh, ish. I mean, up to 3Gs. I have no idea. It'll be very similar to, to Earth, though. It won't be anything crazier. So, we'll see. But I don't know. Honestly, the, the whole SN8 profile blew me out of the water, had a ton of unknowns, and I was shocked. So I, I don't know if I have any of the answers about what they're going to do on Mars yet. So, yeah. It is still frosty, but it seems like they're definitely detanking. So they're definitely detanking. David Swenson, thank you so much. Thanks for your enthusiasm for space. Uh, drinks for the crew. Well, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Um, tonight is going to be very hot drinks. I think we uh, will have to get some hot chocolate. Nothing caffeinated at this hour. Uh, but yeah, Ryan and Gene are, are out there freezing their butts off for us. So they did actually bring hot chocolate. They bring a burner and hot chocolate. And 
uh, yeah, I, I think tonight would be a great night for some some warm drinks. So, yeah, thank you very much, David. I, I'll, I'll make sure I, I treat the crew pretty well. I try to. I think I. When is yeah okay? Andrew Andrew says yeah yeah okay. So hopefully that's that's uh, <laughs> legit. Uh, Stefan says. Uh, thanks for everything you do and keep us inspired. Here's a little contribution to the, the Mystery Studio Project. Thank you so much, Stefan. Uh, hopefully it doesn't disappoint. I don't think it will. If uh, our main if our main idea works out, I don't think it'll disappoint. Uh, Shaky Oregon, like Planet Express from Futurama. Yeah, sorry. I, I was way late on that. Way late. Uh, Joel, thank you so much for the membership. I'm going to kind of speed these up here a little bit because I feel like I'm way behind. Uh, Eric Rubenstein says... Thanks for the effort and great content that you post. We really appreciate all we learned. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for saying hi and hanging out. Uh, Alyssa says, uh, when you get back to Iowa, stop at Zombie Burger and get a, and get poutine on me. Enjoy the slightly warmer weather. Alyssa, that's awesome. I love Zombie Burger. Dang. I would absolutely do that. Zombie Burger is awesome. Zombie Burger is like the most ridiculous burger place Like where you have – you can get macaroni and cheese – Fried macaroni and cheese buns. Let's just put it that way. That that describes it better than anyway else. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Alyssa. Uh, Ryan Libby. Uh, didn't know you're from Iowa. Cheers to the Midwest. Yeah, a couple Iowa comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Gus Frangel says, hi, Tim. Love the content. When can we expect to see some re-entry testing? I've mentioned it a few times. I think my opinion is that seal number 15 will likely be some of the first ones to fly higher and faster and begin uh, really actually seeing how the heat shield handles some higher temperatures and pressure. So that's just my guess. Um, but that's, that's my guess. And that might be, you know, May, June. I have no idea. David letter says, uh, right to bed. It's 3 AM here in Switzerland. And I want to see it. I want to see it live. Uh, unfortunately you might be waiting a little bit long, <laughs> like another day. So Justin Rogers, good stream man. Keep it up. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here and, covering this for you guys uh yossi roden says just wondering are you self-taught about all this space stuff absolutely um in 2014 when i first went to kennedy space center and covered a launch at the time for nasa or for space flight now uh i didn't know anything i didn't i didn't know i could i could maybe tell you what i was learning what a solid rocket booster was versus a, a liquid rocket and i could maybe call out and point to a saturn V and a space shuttle that was it that was literally all of my rocket knowledge right there so uh, so I was self-taught since 2014, and I have a lot more to learn. I am by no means an expert, but my job, I found that my position, my job is because I'm not an expert, to have this curiosity to keep wanting to learn and then teach you guys what I learned. That's the whole point of what I do. I never claim to be an expert. There's people that are out there like, Tim's pretending to be an engineer. He doesn't know anything about engineering. Yeah, I don't. I'll gladly admit that. My dad was an engineer. I grew up working on cars and motorcycles. I have a, a little bit of a, a innate ability to, to tinker on things. But I'm not an engineer. I don't have a degree in any of this stuff. So when I'm telling you what I learn, it's it's the best that I know. And I'm I, I'm not saying that I'm right all the time. And I'm glad to be wrong. And I'm glad to learn. And that's the whole beauty of, uh, of learning is that you can continually shape your knowledge and, and keep learning more and more. And that you once you get – I think I'm beyond the tip of the Dunning-Kruger effect, though. I've been quite humbled knowing that I don't know everything at all. Like I'm very low at the very bottom – rung of of aerospace knowledge but i'm learning I'm, I'm learning and i'm trying to teach you guys everything that i'm learning and that's that's the whole point of this channel so uh landon says you rocked him thank you very much landon i appreciate that um adam says uh first time here love the content keep it up well thank you adam first time man we got a lot for you this is the live stream stuff is not what we normally do like this is a, a small portion of the everyday astronaut channel i I pride myself in making really detailed videos that will break down really intricate topics for you so that so that it's not intimidating. I know that people people think that an hour long video is intimidating just by the hour. They think, "Oh, an hour long video." But because it's an hour, we don't rush through anything. We don't we don't skip steps. We don't uh, we also don't skip the beginning pages. It also allows us to dig deep enough in that you don't have a ton of answer or a ton of questions at the end of the video. That's the whole point of doing long form videos is, hey, we can take this thing as far as I can take it for you. And then you guys just get to sit along for the ride and, and learn as much as I can tell you. So that's that's my that's my opinion on that. And thank you very much for hanging out. I'm, I hope you subscribed and, and find, a, find a lot of videos to help you learn as much stuff as possible. 
Alan B., what was it that caught on fire briefly in the engine bay during the 12.5 kilometer test? Uh, those were when the engines go out, there's still residual fumes. You know, there's literally the pumps are still spinning. There's literally even after uh, shutdown, there's still going to be um, flames spewing out. And because it becomes a low pressure zone, all of a sudden, some of the fuel and, and oxidizer and stuff will, will kind of go up into the skirt and be on fire for a little bit. But it's not like a high in the grand scheme of things. It's not high heat and it's not high pressure, just kind of flames. So, yeah, that's every engine shutdown. We saw that at the very end. We saw uh, a two to one switch. They went from two engines for the flip down to a single engine for the landing burn. But by then, the header tank pressure was too low. The engine was starved of fuel and was running very oxygen rich and just eating itself, eating oxygen at that point. So, um, from Man M, Tech Studio Fun, Tim, keep up the great work. Can't wait for my new full flow t shirt to arrive. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Man M. I appreciate that. Uh, from Mandrake, two, two mans back to back. Come on, Elon, surprise us with a high altitude test. Definitely not today. That would be a big no-no. <laughs> and I would poop my pants because we are not nearly ready here for that stuff. We have a lot more to set up. So I would I would cry if this thing randomly took off. So, yeah, I would actually cry. Uh, but, yeah, Ryan and Gene are within the, ex the exclusion zone of a flight. They're not within the exclusion zone of a test, but they're within the exclusion zone of, a, of the flight. So they would not be able to be there, and that would be very bad for their safety. Charlie, uh, what's the timeline now? It's like looking like tomorrow is our next opportunity for a, um, a static fire. So hopefully that would be Wednesday Central. Uh, uh, hopefully all day long they have until probably 7 or 8 local time to be able to do a test. So hopefully it's tomorrow day so it's warm. And, uh, yeah. Do we want to get them out of there? Did they talk about it yet? I, I see. Let's get. They're just freezing. We can pull up our other camera. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and tell them to pack it up and head on in. Leave the uh, the dishes, but bring in everything else. Okay. Let's keep going here. Uh, from Equin Starbeat says sad Tim noises very much so. But thank you, Equid. Uh, Jacob Wolf. Any indication that the scrub was going to happen based on the lack of tank farm activity a few minutes before? No. That looked like a pretty normal. Uh, the tank farm dies down while the once the more that the fuel goes from the tank farm into the rocket, the more that uh, the less activity you see in the tank farm, the more that you see venting and stuff from the rocket. But also, th we didn't see a ton of tank farm activity because it's it's cold. Uh, when it's a warm, humid day, you see a lot more tank farm activity. So um, we just yeah, we didn't really see that. So all right, from this is from Eddie um, Endy Mion. Uh, so you suppose they might detank a fair bit before a static fire to test their helium pressurization. Uh, I don't think that. Um, I I don't think they're de. I think they're done for the night. They're they're at the end of their window basically. I think they're done for the night, and they they don't need to necessarily test helium pressurization. They would have done that for the wet dress rehearsal. Uh, they know how to handle helium back pressure. Uh, it's probably literally basically a software configuration and just plugging in. Um, a helium port into one of the COPVs that used to use uh, gaseous methane. So shouldn't be too big of a deal. Uh, that's why they were able to do it in weeks. Macbeth, uh, you're, thank you very much, Macbeth. I appreciate that. Uh, David Meyer, thank you. That is really nice. Thank you, David. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, Lazix says, thanks for the 24-hour clock. Personally not a fan of the AM, PM clock. Great overhaul on the website. Love it. Dark mode is fantastic. Yes, big fan of the dark mode look. Um, yeah, the 24-hour clock, though, it the United States is about the only people that don't use a 24-hour clock. It just makes it easier to, to be able to tell, you know, if it's uh, so many things. I, I You know, even even if it said, like, 9 and it's the right time of year, if, you, if we put p.m. or a.m., not everyone associates that. I don't know. It's just I think 24-hour clock is the right thing to do for aerospace, but... Um, thank you for the feedback, though. I do appreciate it, and thanks for checking out the new website. Norm, thank you for the membership. This is from AC uh, Dimilev. says, thank you for your coverage. Looking forward to the upcoming. Uh, yes, he did it, too. Uh, it said SN8 launch, and the SN8 launch after that. Oh, I think he's making fun of me, though. All of them are just going to be SN8 launches. Dang it. I thought I was, I thought, I was like, see, we're still all used to saying, saying SN8, but really... 
It's just that, uh, yeah. Womp womp. <laughs> Sorry that I said SN8. They're all SN8 launches in my heart, and they always will be. Uh, Casey Red Dragon, is LOX made on site or piped in? So they're working on making it on site, but currently it is trucked in, which, um, yeah. Hang on. Uh, Colin McVeigh. Uh, oh, let me just. All right, Colin McVeigh, thank you so much for your tip. That is nice. Thank you very much. That'll go right towards Studio B plans. Let's play bass again. That rocket is stu do still doing things. Dope. It is still venting, but it's not doing um, anything of any particular interest now. So we will see. We will see. But I I'm pretty sure it's done for the night. Uh, Brandon James, do you think they will launch from Texas and land in Florida at some point to test reentry, etc.? I don't think so. That's a big gap. That's further than like the Falcon 9 has ever flown. Uh, it... It just doesn't make sense. If you're going to overfly land anyway, it, it, no, I don't think so. Long, long story short, no. But that's a good question, though. Carmelo says, hi, Tim. Great work. Hopefully, we can get a static fire sometime in the next couple days. That's for sure. Hopefully, we definitely can. <laughs> definitely can. Uh, hang on. Yeah. Hopefully we do see it in the next couple days. Travis Cecil says, uh, start a Tim's vacation slash spectator home near Boca Fund. Well, thank you, Travis. See, there we go. Maybe that that could be what we try to figure out, and then that could be Studio B or something, but we'll see. Uh, Derek Ross, why are serial number 15 through 17 so much further along in the building process than 13 through and 15 or 14? We They, they cut 13. I think they cut 12, 13, and 14. Uh, just because they there were old hardwares, an old design, why fly something old when you have new ones ready to go? So they are uh, they're moving forward onto the the serial number fifteen is kind of the mark of a new new welding techniques, likely new steel again. Um, this is already using three hundred four L, but maybe this new one's using thinner three hundred four L. So they're making progress on on flying new hardware and not old hardware, and that's quite important. So. All right, uh, Debbie Debbie Davy, thank you so much for the tip. I appreciate that. Our Han Hendy, thank you for the membership. Um, uh, Eloquence says, uh, "What will it take to get you to wear the orange Russian suit again?" I have no interest in wearing it again. Honestly, I don't. I don't know what it would take at this point. I have no idea. Um, I don't want to do it for anything like like a, a starship flight or something because I just want to. It sucks to wear. It really sucks to wear. I don't know, maybe for like Halloween or something or some kind of, you know, Yuri's Night or something I'd consider it again. But um, not a, not for any videos or streams or anything. It just doesn't appeal to me. So uh, from Desi Geek says, all the best for your aerospace engineering. How much does it cost? Any age limit when I can start? I am 37. Man, I, I don't know. I You can start right now. Absolutely. I don't know how much it costs because I've never become an aerospace engineer and I've never begun that process. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I think that you, uh, you should absolutely start if that's something you're into. Absolutely. 37. That's I'm, I'm right there with you. So, um, yeah, I, I've, I want to someday go back to school for, I want to go to school for architecture. I want to become an architect someday and I'll, I'll probably be 50 and get little tiny glasses or something, but, uh, in order to fit in, but I, I'll, I have, n I think going back to school to pursue your passions is, is extremely important. Um, Sonic Fan 32, have they overfueled it in detanking for static fire? No. Uh, nope, that would not be likely. They they have a very uh, measuring and, and knowing exactly how much fuel is in the vehicle is extremely, extremely important. Uh, and measuring the exact amounts, it, if it overfilled, that, that's almost an impossibility. So um, I'll just go ahead and say uh, that no, that's not an option. Colin McVeigh. I want to learn more about ground service equipment, tanks, pumps, flame trenches, mobile service towers. Do you think they'll ever make a video about stuff like that? Yes. I do want to make a video about uh, – I've started a couple different I ideas for that, but that's in that long list. Literally a long list of – I feel like I should just show you the long list of ideas because it's uh, – people act like I don't – like it, videos take a long time to make. <laughs> Andrew's laughing in the background because he knows. Here's, um, here's list one of video ideas. 
Okay, there's list one. That's like up. These are upcoming. These are like next. Here's list two of videos. Um, these are like next up part two. Here's uh, part three video ideas, uh, SpaceX videos, and uh, general space flight, and why don't they just and eventually get to. I, I have a lot of video ideas. I have no shortage of video ideas. <laughs> I have no shortage. Yeah. Hmm. But we'll see. That is definitely quite literally on the list. So, uh, Cody, thank you so much for uh, the membership. I, I appreciate that. And same with Robert. Thank you guys both for Robert H. Matthews Jr. for the membership. Uh, Viridus Coyote says, would you rather have three identical International Space Stations or one giant ISS that's three times the size of the current one? A giant one. 100%. Especially bigger, like larger volume spaces, not just the same diameter, you know, stuff that could fit inside the space shuttle. I think it, uh, I think it's time to have a bigger space. And instead of three ISSs, I don't think that would get us too much. I think a giant space station would be awesome. Absolutely. Uh, Stefan says, greetings from Madrid. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. NH Gaming, have you seen the single launch space station unofficial concept? It's a very cool YouTube video. Um, I don't think I've seen the single. Oh, I actually have seen that. Yes, I believe I have seen. If it's the Starship single launch space station, yes, I have seen that. And that is a very cool concept. I agree. And we might see stuff like that. Why not? You know, Starship would be. But at that point, at the same time, I'd rather. It, may, it would make more sense to. You know, Starship has to survive entry and re-entry and, and launch or at least if you made it a space station it still have to survive ascent and then once you're on orbit you still have a lot of extra weight for all these huge fuel tanks you know 100 ton dry mass is nothing to scoff at plus all the you know the, the engines weigh a lot and all this stuff i think you'd be better off just opening up the jaws and releasing an inflatable habitat or something that would be more dedicated so it's lighter weight it's it's more meant to be a space station you're not lugging around anytime you have to do any kind of orbital uh, maneuvers or raising and stuff like that it'd be way 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 easier um yeah uh hammy 243 says you should consider uh you can you should consider micing up your crew for sn9 we could maybe we could maybe do something like that if we wanted to have just a little bit of talk back and stuff we, need we might need a bigger mixer at that point someday we will have a bigger mixer yeah, we we keep expanding. If you knew what we bought between, I don't even want to say it's almost embarrassing. Like what we bought between seal number eight and number nine. I mean, it's got to be well over fifteen grand worth of gear. Well over. Yeah, when I say I spend every penny I make in the stuff, I, it's not a joke. It's not. It's not some hyperbole. It's. It's what I do. <laughs> Try to get you guys the best coverage possible. Uh, Debbie Davy says, uh, thanks for enthusiasm. I'm a proud Patreon supporter. Is there an advantage to static fire tests taking place at night? No, there is not. It's just simply they're out of their window, but Debbie, thank you so much, uh, for, for your support. I really appreciate my Patreon supporters that Patreon supporters are what makes me confident that I'm not just going to go broke when I spend every dime and more than I made in, in trying to do this stuff. So Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate that. But no, there's no there's no advantage other than just trying to use as much time as they can um, at to you know while the vehicle's out and while they're trying. So, yeah. Uh, Sarah Fuller says very good answers to questions about NASA spaceflight streams. I couldn't agree more. Well, good, Sarah. Thank you. I I agree. They are good friends of mine. I I I love the crew at NASA spaceflight. You know, Jack and I have been out here. Jack and I covered Starhopper together. He was out here for Starhopper in twenty. 19 having a hard time remembering now uh and we it was funny because we didn't really know each other at first it was i'll admit like it was kind of awkward because we didn't really we didn't really know i don't know it was like are we friends even though we're both working on other things or whatever and then in the long run now he's become a really good friend and it, i just love seeing him out here although lately this trip and stuff and the last trip is just not as fun because of covid and it's like we can't really hang out hang out but seeing him out of the pad and stuff like that has been really cool so so yeah thank you sarah uh, Roger Foss says, uh, do you think we are in transition from uh, Kardashev civilization class zero to class one? I personally believe we are in that transi transition. Love your channel. Well, thank you, Roger. I do actually think we're 
I keep saying it's the beginning of a new era of, of human of of spaceflight and therefore of of humanity. And I, I truly believe that. I really, really think that we are just at the beginning of seeing humans really live in outer space, live off of our planet long term. So thank you, Roger. Uh, John Clayton, do you think Elon has deliberately left Starship development open to the public so that other countries will be able to copy and hence contribute to building, help build a, a colony on Mars? That's an interesting question, John. I definitely don't. It's, it's Elon. He he's not. He wants everyone to compete with him. And I don't think it's necessarily intentional. I just think that they just don't care. I just don't think they care enough to try to make this all a big secret. So, yeah, that's that's my opinion on the matter. Um, Ashton Henderson. Hey, Tim, big fan of your content. You first introduced me to rockets with your Boeing SpaceX abort system video. Awesome. Keep up the amazing work. Well, thank you, Ashton. <clears throat> thank you for watching. Thank you for hopefully learning and for the support. I really, really appreciate that. All right. Uh, Justin says, uh, <laughs> I like that name, Justin. Is there going to be an actual static fire tonight? No, I'm pretty sure we are done. We're very likely done. So I'll, the answer is no. Patacuna, uh, I run a pizza restaurant in uh, Maryland and have been showing your streams of key events on our 70-inch bar TV. Can't wait for the future of this channel. That is super cool, Pat. I love that. I, that is like the ultimate – that's the ultimate compliment, knowing that there's people just hanging out together watching space flight. Like that's the dream. This is to me – to me, this is more exciting than sports. I've never been someone to really care about sports. Other than sports will make me cry randomly when there's like – acts of sportsmanship like sportsmanship is the thing that will make me cry like when an enemy or like an opposing team like helps someone or like you know celebrates someone else's victory like that's something like no, they didn't have to do that you know like uh other than that's the only thing that's the only thing i'd ever watch sports for other than that space flight space flight baby yeah and i'm glad to see it's almost becoming that way it's becoming like a uh people tuning in and, and, and treating it like that almost because it is it's something to look forward to and something to cheer for so yeah Ash Daddy, Tim, I am an engineer, BSME, retired from Air Force. Your videos and knowledge surpass most engineers. Still, this money is for your conversation, at, your your conversion accuracy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ash Daddy. I I was actually shocked that I that I knocked that kilogram on, like on the nose, pretty much. But I'll remember now. Twenty two point six eight. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ash Daddy. Ben Pike, thank you so much. I really appreciate your tip. Uh, from Dino Track, great name. Uh, thank you for doing what thank you for doing what I can't do. Dino Track, that is exactly why we are here, because not everyone can make this stuff happen. You know, I know that I'm fortunate enough to have a life that I can dedicate to this stuff because it does if you are trying to casually observe this stuff, you will lose a lot of money on hotels and you will likely not see anything. I thought I got down here to I we were so nervous. Andrew had a shoot on last Saturday. We were really thinking he was going to miss it. And here we are four days later, still no static fire even. So it's really hard. Even us, uh, I'll say armchair experts of watching this stuff. At least I'll, I'll, I'll call myself an expert of watching it, <laughs> but I, I, an expert watcher, even those of us that, that are tuned into this stuff professionally, um, we still get it wrong. So trying to casually watch this stuff and come down and see it. It's it's going to be awesome, and there will be plenty of opportunities. But for now, in the early days, it is hard. It is very hard. Uh, pair of character from KW. Thank you very much. By the way, James and and Jody, I or jo, uh, Jody, I definitely have seen it, and I will see it in the. It's coming up in in the queue. So you guys are, are coming up. Don't worry, Discord. I'm not forgetting about you. I've seen the debate. Uh, Cosmic Sands Green Kirby. Ah, uh, here we go again. Thank you very much, Comic Sans. Uh, but not today. <laughs> It'll be tomorrow. Um. All right. So this is from Steve Baker. Why are some tanks painted white and others black? Why are some vertical and others horizontal? That's a really good question. I actually need to learn up. Learn up. <laughs> I guess that kind of works. I need to learn as much as I can and scrub up on all of the tanks and what exactly each tank is. I should probably do a video about that someday, especially as they're building the super heavy site, the orbital pad. Um, and as we start to see more tanks go out there, go through what each one is and how they work and all that stuff. So, all right, Jason, um, I still sometimes say SN8 too. Okay. Or just laws. Thank you, Jason. I'm glad I'm not alone because 
I'd say it all the time. Aaron, if they truck in locks, what exactly do the tank farms do? Love your work. First time uh, I've been able to catch a live stream. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, well, the, the tank farms are to hold it so they don't have trucks on the pad. Like they, they fill these tanks to the brim uh, and they bring them in truck by truck by truck, fill them up, and then hold it there until they're ready for launch. So the tanks are, are vacuum insulated. So there's basically a cylinder. You suck out all the air and then you have another cylinder. It's just kind of held by some points and then you can keep it cold uh, as cold as possible. And then you can recondense it and, and make it and liquefy it uh, and keep it liquid and all that stuff as you fuel up the rocket. So that's about all I know. This stuff is still quite foreign to me. I definitely need to ask some more questions and learn more about it and someday make a video about it. Like I said, ground support would be an awesome. Yeah. Edward says orange equals good goal reward to do for a charity event. Orange suit probably. Yes, that could be a charity event. You're right. Well, Tim put on the suit or something for charity. That would probably be worth it. Alec, we were asking about the RD-150, so I was wondering if you checked on archive.org because there are some documents that touch on it. I love the streams. I believe we've gone to archive. Well, we, we've gone to the Internet Archive to find old articles that were taken down from, like, uh, from um, uh, Energomosh and stuff like that. But, yeah, not, not – I, I don't think I've seen anything specifically from archive.org, but we – Andrew, want to write that down quick or just remind me? Archive.org. Got it. Um, James Packer, thank you so much for the membership. And from Michael, Irish, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? <sighs> Man, I, I'm probably team 100 duck-sized horses because... No, they could, they could all trample you. They could swarm you. But then what? They just lightly kick you with their tiny hooves? Like, oh, no, nay, nay, nay. They could hunt with you. Hunt? Yeah, but they could go over you with a hundred. And then what? Could they bite you with their tiny little chompers? They're, they're omnivores, so they don't have, you know, they have, they're still pretty strong teeth. I've been bit by a horse before. It's not pleasant, but it's not, hmm. Man, I, I don't know. I'll let the internet decide. <laughs> cop out. Cop out answer. But a, a horse-sized duck. Do I get any weapons? If I get like if I just had a spear or something, like come on. I could take that out. Easy. I just poke it in the heart and it's gone. Uh give it a little heart poke. That's assuming it's attacking me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna kill a horse-sized duck for no reason. It's it's, it's coming after me and my friends and family. And I have a spear. I'd much rather do one horse-sized duck. All right. Discord, here you go. Get ready, Discord. Yeah, you're right. Casper, I could just befriend it. There's probably the best answer. Just befriend it, and then you don't have to fight it. There's the answer. Here we go. From Anoush Patel. This is big. This has been all Discord's been talking about all night. Day, day, month, month, year, year. Or year, year, month, month, day, day. Or month, month, date, day, 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 year, year. Many thanks from the patrons of Discord. So, okay, I, I, I gotta admit, I, have, I obviously grew up with the month, month, day, day, year, year. That's stupid. That is dumb. That's wrong. I actually, personally, I actually like day, day, month, month, year, year best because that goes from smallest integer of time to largest integer of time. But I also actually think when you for like file structure and stuff in your computer, I actually think year, year, month, month, day, day makes the most sense because um, sometimes if I'm just looking through a bunch of files, I want to know, especially if it's been years, I want to know what year it was. So I'm actually, I'm going to go ahead and say my official opinion is year, year, month, month, day, day. That's my official, what I think is best. Largest to smallest. You heard it here first. Uh, from Michael McLean. Open an everyday astronaut uh, cantina in Boca Chica. Well, Elon's already doing stuff in Boca Chica. I'm not going to be able to do anything in Boca Chica, but maybe I could do something someday in uh, Port Isabel or South Padre Island. So I would love to do that someday, especially if this stuff just keeps going the way it is. Like, how could you not? It'd be so fun. So definitely, definitely something I would love to do. Brian Clausen, how are you, Brian? Love to hear from you. As always, captive audiences and staying 
and still staying to watch and talk with you, even when you call it SNA law. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's so great to always hear from you. Thank you. Uh, Lala Lily, I've asked you before for, uh, I've asked you before for $20, but can you please ask Elon to create a probe to drill into Europa? Thanks for what you do. Well, actually, don't forget, there is the Europa Clipper mission, which has the ability potentially to do a Europa. I still think things like that should be government funded because there is no profit incentive to exploration, frankly. Like there's, there's a profit incentive to deliver something to explore, but who's going to pay for uh, that's where I think NASA still needs to be leading the front is making these, you know, flagship missions to far off worlds with dedicated science instruments and things that are that don't have a profit. Like who's going to uh, sure Elon could probably fund a, a vehicle to go to Europa. But, you know, I don't think that's necessarily his job. I think his job would be his time and effort would be better spent getting it cheap enough to make it arbitrary to be able to send something off to Europa or the outer solar system. Uh, Shrunken Flash, any idea on why they haven't detanked SN9 yet? It seems odd they're just letting out spurts of gas like this. Well, this is relative, this isn't unheard of. Um, you know, sometimes it does just do um, little spurts like that and it's a really cold night. So we probably are seeing the condensation there uh, for w longer than we're used to, but um yeah it's it's scrubbed i mean it, it's done cole topping some money towards studio b love your channel thank you so much cole and from james bramlett says okay today is uh 12th of january <laughs> anyways personal favorite current band of these 21 uh uh anyway personal favorite current band of these okay between 21 pilots five finger death punch kg elephant uh, and Foo Fighters, I would of of those I would say Twenty One Pilots because I think they're uh, I think they're actually a really really talented band that's very eclectic and I like the sounds that they bring to the table between everything and just really clever songwriting, uh, really unique sounds. I'm actually yeah I, I like Twenty One Pilots. I'd say I'm a pretty I'm a pretty big fan. I mean I don't like listen to them regularly, but I think they're cool. Um, and KG Elephant, I gotta say. Wrong. Uh, I like them, but I, I like Tame Impala better. I don't know. I, just for some reason, those two bands are on the same radar to me. But and Foo Fighters. I mean, you gotta love. You gotta love Dave. Like, uh, but I'm not actually like an avid Foo Fighter fan per se. I was a. But yeah, that's that's uh, that's my opinion. But other than that, my personal favorite current bands. Other than that, like I love. Um, I don't even know. I I, I like a lot. Uh, Tycho is still one of my favorite bands. Um, but, and that one honeybee song that I was listening to over and over and over and over and over and over and over last time we were here, the great song. We haven't listened to it, we haven't listened to it yet. Yeah. We probably should. Maybe that's why it's not happening. Yeah. All right. We're going to listen to that tonight. <laughs> oh, that's a great song. Hun it's honeybee by, what is it? it oh, Immortal something orchestra. Yeah, something. It's a weird name that doesn't fit the sound at all, but it's yeah. such a hot song. Unknown Mortal Orchestra. Thank you. Great song. Honeybee. Uh, Nicholas can't think of anything. Hey, Tim, do you know how fast Starship is going is going during the skydiving maneuver? Oh, Declan knows. I don't remember. We could pull it up on Flight Club. We can do that. Give me a minute here because, of course, it doesn't let me put in a address without doing this quick, and that's really dumb. Uh, and I might have to sign in to Flight Club. So just give me a second here. Um, I will let you guys know. Sign in with Patreon. If it'll let me. And one second here, guys. And everyone. <laughs> Six. Four oh five. I don't even know how to do this anymore, do I? Okay, okay, hang on. I'm getting close, I'm getting close. So we need to go to simulations. Uh, all right, go ahead, I'll show people how to do this. So I'm on simulations uh, on Flight Club. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to past missions. We're going to try and find Snate, SN8. <laughs> I feel like he actually called it 
Oh, here we go. We can just pull up Starship SN9. So we'll take this. We're going to run it. Run simulation. And it's going to give us a pretty darn good representation of maximum velocity. So it looks like the maximum velocity is actually on descent and would be about 140 meters per second, which translates to... Let's just kind of get this um, 140 meters per second to kilometers per hour first. 504 kilometers an hour, which would be about 300 miles an hour, is the fastest that it ends up falling uh, while doing the belly flop maneuver. By the It slows down, though, because obviously the atmosphere gets thicker and thicker, uh, provides more resistance, and eventually it gets down to about 70 or so uh, meters per second, but right when doing that flip maneuver. So, uh, yeah, so between 140 basically 100 and about 140 down to about 70 um, all just from the atmosphere. So yeah, there you go. All right. Back to the rocket from Jack um, question. What kind of bear is best bears beats Battlestar Galactica uh, uh, throw up the rocket real quick to you again. Um, uh, I think the best bear is obviously the polar bear because they are adorable. Actually, Little brown bears are cute, too. They basically look like big dogs. I would say the best bear is the bear that lets you, that doesn't kill you. <laughs> That's the best bear. Uh, this is from Chininator. Hey, Tim, love all your videos and content. Thank you very much, Chininator. I appreciate that. Uh, Brendan Cross, hey, Tim, I just finished a cadet thing as a senior. We were unable to do the planned lesson, so we ended up watching your, your reentry video. That is awesome. Well, thank you very much, Brendan. That is super cool. Man, I wish... Uh, wish I had a teacher that cool when I was growing up. I had great teachers, but I guess we didn't have YouTube. So maybe my cool teachers back then would be doing that stuff now. Uh, from Jel, uh, Jelisab. Hey, Tim, is it true that you will offer yourself as an, a visiting experienced orientation officer for Rocket Lab soon? Well, I absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, assuming that the launch goes off when we're not doing anything here, uh, I absolutely will be covering that. There's, there's a couple launches that might be happening in the next couple days. Um, Rocket Lab is what, Saturday? Yes. Ooh, it's actually Friday night. That's going to be rough. Mm -hmm. We'll see. It, it, I might not be able to cover it if we're, if we, if we streamed all day Friday, I'm not going to be able to cover Rocket Lab on, on late Friday night. So yeah. Uh, this is from Sandra. I own 75 acres, five miles from Boca Chica launch pad. Come join our development to an open space center, et cetera. Sandra, that is interesting. I wonder where that's at. Well, dang, Sandra. Um, you can find my email online or, or reach out probably on like Instagram or something would be the easiest way. That is very intriguing, actually. Um, that is very, very intriguing. Let's talk. I, I like the way that sounds. Um, but guys, I think that's actually going to do it for me because I think we're – we're just literally, quite literally watching paint dry at this point now. So um, there is definitely no reason to keep streaming paint drying. And I definitely want to uh, get some food in my tummy and in the rest of the team's tummy. So uh, before all, before everything closes up, because that is a big concern out here, is things <laughs> we might be too late already. Nine o'clock is the cutoff for a lot of places. So um, I'm going to try to get everybody fed, but I'm I'm quite confident that hopefully we'll see another static fire attempt here hopefully tomorrow we will see so um yeah let me know if there's um let, let me know if there's uh anything that you guys uh want to know about and find me on twitter ask me some questions and all that stuff and yeah we will uh we'll, we'll be bringing you guys some coverage so thank you very much for tuning in with us uh i think that's it i think yeah i'm gonna go get food i'm gonna get food get the team fed so thank you guys so much for those of you that that uh that tipped and those of you that went online and found our you know the launch day coupon for this again if you want to support what i do consider going to everydayastronaut.com slash shop uh today if you use coupon code launch day all one word all lowercase uh you can click on our full flow stage combustion cycle collection anything on this page is going to be 10 percent off today uh, for the next 24 hours so yeah and if get some nerdy stuff for you we're stocked up on almost everything else again i think we are out of stock on this exact hoodie but we're working on getting those refilled as we speak. So, uh, yeah, so just shop around. You'll find some fun stuff, including stuff for little tiny humans. If you have a little human in your life, 
everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And again, thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. If you guys want to help me do what I do and help me make a Studio B someday and just continue to expand this and make it uh, make everything possible. And, of course, join our awesome Discord channel. Who Hi, Discord. Love you guys. Uh, who, uh, yeah, who are awesome. Uh, go to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Well, all right. I love you guys. Wish us luck. Hopefully we see a static fire here tomorrow. And hopefully we see a flight here by the weekend. Big time fingers crossed. We will see. All right, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody. Let's see how you do, Andrew. Wow. <laughs> and I also hope I'm un I hope I'm not muted yet, actually. <laughs>